I recently got a message that moved me to tears. Can I read it to you? Yeah. Okay, so I got this message on on Facebook from a woman I met in the Netherlands like three years ago, and I haven't spoken to her since then. And she wrote, Hey, Eric, I'm not sure if you remember me, but we were at Primal together. And I wanted to share my memory of you because it meant the world to me. It was your reaction when I shared my personal story. Your presence was so pure, honest, and still welcoming. You were holding the space for me so perfectly calm and still somehow showing me that you wouldn't rather be anywhere else in that moment. I think I felt for the first time what it means having somebody just there for me. And you gave me a hug at the end, and I felt so understood and seen. It still brings tears to my eyes when I go back there. Thank you so much for giving me this experience. I do my best not to settle for less since then. I'm eternally grateful to you for this. Wow. <laughs> yeah, wow. I'm getting shivers listening to that. She never had an experience like that before. And she she don't want to settle for less in the future. Uh, I get shivers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I get shivers as well. And uh, reading this, it, it really brought tears to my eyes. And... Yeah, I felt some loving, moving feeling in my chest uh, when I read this. And I mean, this might sound a bit arrogant, but what fascinates me the most with this is that I barely remember her and I barely remember this conversation. But somehow, something that I did there had such a powerful impact. Just my presence, just me listening to her, that it had this big change in her life. Wow. So you don't even remember her, and still you had that effect. That is quite remarkable. So why are we starting this podcast episode with this letter you received from this woman? So the topic of today's episode is empathy. And another way for empathy could be deep human connection. And for you listening, I'd like you to imagine what your life would look like if you could create the kind of conversations that I had with this woman. What would it mean for your relationships if you could make people feel seen this way? What would it mean for your career if you had this kind of bond with your clients, with your colleagues, and even with your bosses? Or how meaningful would your life be if you knew that when I wake up today, if I have a conversation with someone, they might remember that conversation three years from now? Wow. And this episode really is a deep guide to happier relationships. This is a guide to understand other people and to be understood. This is a guide to avoid feeling lonely to avoid feeling misunderstood, to avoid conflicts in all of your relationships, and to become a person that other people trust with their deepest secrets. This is by far the most important episode that we have ever done. We've been working on it every week for four months, and we should probably put it behind some kind of paywall, but we would much rather give it to you for free because we want you to have happier relationships. And Think of this more like an audiobook than a podcast because it's so much information in it. So even though this podcast is for free, we want you to treat it as something valuable because a lot of work has gone into it. We want you to listen to it, reflect, pause, listen to it again. And we have really designed this as a process so you can understand where is your current level when it comes to empathy in your relationships. And you will know what is the next step and the next step to really master this skill. 
And for you to do that, you need to treat this as something valuable. You need to not only listen to it and then forget it. We need you to practice it, to take the tips we give you and experiment in your life, reflect, and then try again. And if you listen to this episode and take it to your heart, really practice the things we talk about and try to learn this, we can promise you that it will dramatically improve your life and it will give you so much happier relationships. And during that period, you have been thinking about these concepts. A lot. A lot, yeah. You know that the main goal of empathy is to stay connected to the emotions behind the story. You know that you shouldn't interrupt. You know some other theories and techniques that we will talk more about in this topic. So at level four, you don't need the theory, but you did need the theory to get to level four. And if you're new here to this podcast, I am here with, as always, my good friend Eric Bergman. Eric made over $50 million before he turned 30 when he founded his previous company, Katina Media, that went from zero to 300 employees in just five years. And he's currently the founder of Great.com, a company that will give away 100% of its profits to save the environment. And besides great, Eric is teaching personal development and entrepreneurship to his over 1 million followers on social media. Pleasure doing this episode with you, Eric. Pleasure doing this podcast with you, Emil. So I'm here, as always, with Emil, who is my best friend, and I've known him for 15 years. And now we're also neighbors. And he's among the smartest people that I know. And I love this creative process with him because he always comes up with new questions and new angles on things. And he was the first one joining me in Great a few years ago. And on the side of Great, he also runs a personal development and coaching business where he teaches people about the topics that we do in this podcast. Good to be here. Good to be here with you. And this podcast is the becominggreat.com podcast. And we have one big goal. To be the podcast in the world that has the most value per minute out of any podcast within entrepreneurship and personal development. And we plan to accomplish this by spending a lot of time preparing, planning, and researching each episode to make sure that we don't tell any pointless stories or just ramble. And we also don't have any advertisement because we think it's pretty annoying with advertisements in podcasts. So we are giving this to you for free with no ads whatsoever. And this episode is split up in six different topics. And once again, you can think of it more like an audiobook than a regular podcast. And the first topic is what is empathy? Empathy is a big word and it's pretty complicated. So we will dive into what empathy actually means and how it feels. And both me and Emil were actually bad at empathy for a long time without even knowing it. So in this topic, we will also look into how do you know if you are good or bad at empathy? The second topic is called the four stages of empathy. And this topic is all about the four stages that you need to climb up on your way of mastering the skill of empathy. You will learn which stage you're currently at and what is the step forward to master empathy. And topic three is called behaviors that block empathy. And here we will look into what is the main goal with empathy and what are the different behaviors that we do that stop us from reaching that goal. Topic four is called how to give empathy. And this topic is all about the state of mind that you need to be in to give empathy to others. And you will also learn a lot of useful techniques that you can use to build trust and create deeper connections with everyone you meet. And topic five is called how to receive more empathy. And in this topic, we will look into what you can do to make other people want to understand you, want to be there for you. And that way you will get much more friends. You will feel a lot less lonely and a lot more understood by others. 
The sixth and final topic is called when empathy is your superpower. And here you will learn a lot of useful techniques that you can do to turn experiences like anger, frustration, conflict into something that is positive. And when you know how to do that, then empathy truly is your superpower. And for you listening, if you want more meaningful relationships, happier life and more success, make sure that you click subscribe because we put over four months into this episode and we will pour months of hard work into our future episodes as well. And you don't want to miss them. I promise you. Let's dive into this one. So I'm 20 years old and I'm sitting in the couch in my apartment watching TV. And my girlfriend that I've been with for three years enters the room. And um, you know that feeling when you just look at someone and you can feel like instinctively that something is wrong. That, <laughs> yeah. that you have done yeah, something bad. I know what bad. she's talking about. Yeah. And I got that feeling and she just entered the room and turned off the TV And she told me, I've had an abortion. And I didn't know what to say. I just said, okay, uh, are, you, are you all right? And she said, yeah. Yeah, I still didn't know what to say. So the conversation just kind of ended there. But I wasn't okay. Instead of me, I... I had questions like, why didn't you tell me about this before? Um, does that mean something is wrong? Like, what should you do before you make an abortion? Should I be included? Doesn't she trust me? But I had no idea how to express any of these thoughts. So I just kind of stayed quiet. I can imagine. Like it's, it's a difficult situation to be on both ends of that. Yeah, it was for sure equally yeah, difficult for, for sure. her. She had no idea what to do, so of course. Did you talk to her again about it later? No, I don't think we ever spoke about this again. Whoa. Did you talk to anyone else? No, you're the first person I ever tell this to. Wow. It's been 13 years. <laughs> so why do you think that you didn't tell anyone? I don't think, I think I never talked with her about it because I assumed it would end up with maybe her being sad or us getting into a conflict or an argument. And I didn't speak with other friends. I don't know, I, honestly. I, I never even considered really telling someone about this. It's interesting. Like, it's such a big thing. Mm. And still, like, You just held on to it yourself. Yeah. And I didn't even consider really talking to anyone about this. Did you feel lonely in all of this? Mm, no. At least not consciously. I guess I was lonely. Because I had to keep this feeling that there's something wrong with me and our relationship all to myself. So were there other situations that happened that were difficult that you didn't talk to about as well? Yeah, when I think about it, that was kind of a pattern. This was my first you know, long-term relationship. And I can remember, yeah, I have one example. Can I tell it? It's a little bit longer. Sure. I remember one year after this abortion incident happened, my girlfriend got accepted into another university. That was two hours away from Stockholm, where I live. So I was happy for her, but this meant that we went from living together to being in a long-distance relationship. And long-distance relationships are hard. It's hard. And I remember I often missed her so much that it felt like I could explode because I, I really loved her. But like, an upside with long-distance relationships is that like when you meet each other, It's it's so much better. You know, you have this like sexual tension that builds up and you really miss each other. So the region when you reunite, that is often a wonderful experience. And it was this one time where we hadn't seen each other for 
two months and I really, really missed her. And I was also 21 something. So I <laughs> had a lot of hormones, a lot of hormones at that point. <laughs> right. So I remember going down there after not seeing her for two months and for a week before that, and for the whole two-hour trip down, I was fantasizing in my mind about how it would be like being reunited with her. I was fantasizing about like the kiss we would have, how she would prepare the room with romantic music and candlelight and put on sexy clothes. And then I, you know, I fantasized about all the different kinds of ways the sex could play out. I was excited. <laughs> I was excited. <laughs> right. But then when I got down there, she was happy to see me. But it felt like we had been apart for one day, not two months. There were no candles. She wore regular clothes. There were no music. We didn't even have this long kiss that I had imagined when I stepped through the door. And that made me confused, honestly. I I wondered why why hasn't she like is this less important to her than it is to me? Hasn't she missed me? Um, because I had looked to me it would feel like an explosion and for her it just seemed like an everyday encounter. So we sat down in her bed and she started telling me stories about her student life, you know, and you know, when you go to a new university, you have these parties all the time and you meet a lot of new people and she seemed to have a lot of fun. And um, like, part of me was happy for her, but I can also see that those stories really triggered me. They made me really insecure that maybe she's moving on with her life. She's having all these new experiences, meeting these new people, going to parties and... My life kind of stayed the same in Stockholm. So I was really struggling to just hear her stories. And I more and more had this feeling inside of me that I wanted to make things sexual. So like every opportunity I get, I try to like touch her and get close to her and like try to kiss her romantically. And I would just feel that the more I did that, she would just pull back. And that made me even more insecure. And I more and more felt like rejected by her and that she didn't want me. And I had this like uh, feeling over my chest, like that was just maybe jealousy or, and I got more and more desperate. So I more and more like tried to push for sex and like get closer to her and I could feel her being repulsed by that. And this just kept happening. Like like in a chain reactor that she pulled away more. I approached more. And finally she just stood up in the bed and said, stop it. Like, I hate sex. I hate sex. And then like all hope just vanished for me in that moment. I felt like I would sink through, through her bed and into the floor. And I was like, fuck. Now I really messed something up. And I had this fear coming in that I messed this up. And does this mean that I'm bad at sex? Am I a bad boyfriend? She doesn't want to be with me. What does this mean for our relationship? Just panic. And I had no idea how to deal with it. <sighs> yeah, that was that was really hard. I think it was one of the biggest strikes to my self-esteem in my entire life. Yeah, I can see that. And I can really understand the confusion. Like you're coming there and you you know how important this is to you. Yeah. And when it feels like it isn't important to her, then something doesn't add up in that picture. I felt so powerless. And I even feel this pressure over my chest now just telling this story. Yeah, I didn't like that feeling. It was really hard. So did you ever talk to her about that situation later on? <laughs> was this the end of your relationship or did you stay together? No, we stayed together after that. Uh, like 
well, first of all, we didn't even talk about it then. I was mm-hmm. I was just like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Like, step back. And there was this awkward silence for a while. And then, like, maybe we started talking more about the university or just some random talk, just trying to forget that this happened. Because I think, I mean, she was equally uncomfortable as I was, of course. And we didn't know how to speak about it. And, and just from a, like, timeline perspective this is after like you arrived there there was no sexual energy you felt confused and needy i presume seeking her validation showing like we should have sex why don't we kind of yeah and then instead of having sex you talked about her university experience which made you even more like triggered and worried Yes. Seeking more validation, like wanting to set things, like normalize the energy. Like if we just had sex, then things would be good. Yeah. In a sense. I couldn't put it in words like that back then, but I think yeah. that's what I was looking for. And then when she kept rejecting you, you felt desperate to get yeah. that kind of energy reset yeah. somehow. And then she just snaps. And yeah. screams that she hates sex. Yeah. And you just feel completely, I'm assuming, shocked by that. Shocked, yes. Yeah, like, what yes. What just happened? Yeah. How did we end up here? Yeah. How this was did... supposed to be a happy, happy yeah. moment. I've been looking forward to it for two months, and then yeah. completely opposite happens. Yeah, like, how did we go from romantic fantasy explosion to whatever this is. Yeah. Okay, so you stay together after this and you never talk to her about that situation and especially not during that time when you spend with her in the university. Did you talk to anyone else about this? No, never. You're, the f- again, the first person I tell this story to. And I had a lot of friends, but... I don't didn't know how to have a conversation like that. And it was just kind of not the stuff you would talk about with the guy friends I had back then. Okay. And did you feel lonely when it came to this situation? Yeah. I've, like, I had to carry that heaviness all by myself and I had no one to talk to. Yeah. I don't. I don't think I would ever put the word loneliness on it, but I can see looking back that... I was lonely. So before we continue, let me just zoom out a little bit and explain to you listening why we are starting this episode about empathy with two difficult relationship stories. So empathy is this big and pretty complicated word that all of us have heard, but few of us really know what it means or how it feels. If you would have asked me five years ago if I was good at empathy, I would have said yes, but honestly, I wouldn't have any idea what I was talking about. I didn't know what empathy really was or how it felt, and I definitely didn't know if I was good or bad at it. So we're starting with these two stories because they clearly show what your life looks like when you haven't learned the skill of empathy yet, because then you will not know what to say in difficult situations, and you will not know how to share your own feelings in a difficult situation. So let's continue. So I'm I'm curious about something. I asked you in both of your stories before if you felt lonely when these situations happened. And I wonder, well, you, you said that you weren't, but I wonder in, in general, in your life at this time, did you feel lonely? I never would have said that because when I was... 21, 22, like at this age, I was always surrounded by friends. There were people over in my apartment all the time. So no, I wouldn't say that. Do you think it's possible to feel lonely even though you you are surrounded by people? Back then, I never would have even considered that. Yeah. So I think loneliness is is an interesting concept. Like it's a feeling and it's hard to describe a feeling like how does love feel? How does loneliness feel? Like, yeah, 
it's really hard. Like you can say this is a table or this is a chair, but it's hard to say this is a certain feeling. And because of that, you can be lonely without having any idea that that's the feeling that you are having. Even if you're surrounded by people or maybe you're having the time of your life, but you can still carry that feeling without being aware of it. So when it comes to loneliness, I like thinking of it as symptoms of loneliness. So signs that this is what you're carrying around. And one of the big signs of loneliness, which is why I asked it before when you told the stories, is that you don't share with anyone how you are feeling. That you would rather hold on to this pain alone than tell anyone about it. And we often think that we don't want to tell anyone about it. And that's the reason why we don't. But in reality, I believe that that's almost never true. I think that we're screaming inside to share with someone the pain that we are feeling. My assumption is that when your ex-girlfriend told you about the abortion or about that she hated sex, I think you were screaming inside to tell her what you were feeling. But you had no idea how to do that. So instead you held on to it. And you thought that you didn't want to tell her, but you wanted to, you just didn't know how. Yeah, and that's that's mind-blowing. And um, yeah, if you define loneliness as... If included in the definition of loneliness is do you dare to show your feelings or your pain and talk about it to other people, then I was constantly lonely. I carried all of this heaviness all on my own for about 13 years until I told you now. <laughs> and I was the only one. I was the only one there. Yeah, and I think that is so common. So there are three major signs or symptoms of loneliness. The first one is that you don't share what you are feeling. You don't talk about your own pain. And the second one is similar to that, but it is that other people don't share their pain or difficulties with you. Did you feel that your ex-girlfriend shared with you during this time? No, because we never talked about this stuff. So she didn't come to me for whatever reason. Did any other friends that you had come to you with difficult things? Not really. We mostly talked about fun stuff. Yeah. And so what happens here is when, when you share about something painful or someone shares about something painful with you, you're connecting with that person. You're talking about feelings and what's real. And when you're lonely, it's because you're not connecting with someone. Like you're disconnected. Yeah. It's the opposite. Like connection is the opposite of loneliness. So there's a, a third symptom, which is a bit different, uh, but it is that you are constantly keeping your mind busy. And you are very rarely just in silence or walking or just sitting or just being. During this time, did you ever just be? Mm, no, never. I think the first time I ever tried meditating, for example, that was years later. I was 25 and I could, couldn't even make it through a 15-minute meditation. It was really hard for some reason to just sit still and focus on my breath for 15 minutes. Yeah, so that's, that's a clear sign then of that you needed to keep your mind busy. Because I think it's common that we like being alone. Like we don't feel lonely because we're alone either. You can be al lonely amongst people and you can be lonely because you're alone, but you could also be alone and enjoying it because you're keeping your mind busy. Like a lot of people like being alone, but when they are alone, they want to play a lot of video games or they want to read a lot of books or they want to work on their music or their business or whatever. Like all of these are behaviors that keep your mind busy. So you can like being alone, but you could still feel lonely when you're alone. You're just not aware of it. Right. So I, I could be feeling lonely, but then I distract myself from that feeling by scrolling Instagram or just doing something. Yeah. I'm, 
and not even like distracting. You're just constantly occupying yourself. You never even yeah. get to that feeling because you you're constantly busy. Yeah, I can see during these years, I had a period for a couple of years actually where I drank whiskey every night before going to bed. I think around the same time, I played a lot of video games. I watched a lot of porn. I watched a lot of TV, played a lot of poker online, went yeah. out to bars a lot. Like I was always doing stuff. Yeah, so all of these are typical signs of keeping your mind busy. And the reason why we do this is we're not aware of that we're distracting ourselves from something. But as you said, you just tried to meditate for 15 minutes and you couldn't. Yeah. So instead you went out and did something else, or at least you didn't go back to meditation. And the reason is that you need, you feel drawn to do something else. You feel drawn to keep your head busy. And when we can't sit still for 15 minutes, it's often because we get like, disturbed inside. And that feeling is actually loneliness. You just don't have the word for it. So you wouldn't call yourself lonely because you were around friends or you enjoyed being alone because you were reading or playing poker. But in reality, you were probably carrying around this feeling without knowing what it was. And that was the reason you couldn't meditate. And that was the reason you were constantly busy. Right. So why are we talking about loneliness then in a podcast episode about empathy and happy relationships. So as I said before, empathy is this big and complicated word that it's difficult to understand. And one way to understand it is what is the opposite of it. And loneliness is the opposite of empathy. So empathy is to connect with someone else's feelings and understand them. And loneliness is when you're not connected to anyone's feelings and no one is connected to yours. So one way to understand how it feels to be connected to someone's feelings is to think of it as when you're watching a movie. So imagine that you're in the cinema and you're all caught, caught up in this, this movie and you see the hero on stage. And when you see the hero struggling, you can really feel that they're struggling, right? Yeah, And when the hero is sad, someone dies, you feel sad along with the hero, right? Might cry. Yeah, you might even cry. And by the end of the movie, when the hero wins, because they almost always do, you get happy. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> right. And what's interesting here is that I believe this is why almost all movies end happily, because then you walk out feeling happy because you're connected emotionally to the hero. But if the movie ends sad, you remember this movie with this sad feeling in your body. You haven't really gotten that happy release and the dopamine kick of it. So what happens here is that the director of a good movie is good at communicating the feelings of the hero. They show the struggle. Maybe they even let you hear the hero's thoughts. You see what the hero cares about and you're connecting to them emotionally. So this is actually what empathy feels like. Mm. You're feeling along with the hero. And if you're with your ex-girlfriend and you don't really understand what she's feeling and she doesn't understand what you're feeling, there isn't a connection here. Like It's not like with the hero. You don't know right. what she's feeling. And I was with all of my friends all the time, but they didn't really understand, at least not my painful and difficult feelings. So in that, I was lonely, even though I was surrounded by, by people. They didn't exactly. understand me as the hero in my movie. No, exactly. You probably spoke about football and stuff. Yeah, and I didn't understand them either. They were probably going through <laughs> similar things, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So this is why we're talking about loneliness in an episode about empathy, because it's important to understand what loneliness is and how it feels to understand what the opposite is of that. Right. And it's important to understand what loneliness and how it feels to understand how much or how little you know about empathy. Because just like you, I would never have described myself as lonely in my 20s. 
I was constantly around, surrounded with people. I was constantly doing things. But when I look back, I realized that I was never emotionally connected yeah. to anyone. I never felt understood by anyone, but I wasn't aware of it. So let me summarize what we've been talking about to see if I understand you correctly. It's hard to know what empathy is, but we can maybe understand empathy by understanding the opposite of empathy, which is loneliness, which is we don't feel connected with people. We don't share emotional experiences with other people like you would with a hero in a movie. Instead, we feel separated. And we can feel separated even if we're in the same room as plenty of people because we don't understand what they're going through and they don't understand what we are going through. And we might even feel separated with ourselves in a sense. I can see that the reason I was using all of these behaviors that kept my mind busy, like video games and porn and poker and not being, being able to sit still, was because I probably didn't even share emotional experiences <laughs> with myself. I didn't feel my own feelings. So I was lonely even, even with me. And so those would be the three major signs of loneliness that I don't share my feelings with others. Others don't share my, their feelings with me. And I use a lot of these behaviors that keep my mind busy. Yeah, exactly. Well summarized. And for you listening, if you recognize these symptoms, if you don't share what you're feeling, if others don't share with you, and if you're constantly busy, like you're struggling to sit still quietly for 10 minutes, it's probably because you haven't learned the skill of empathy. And you probably feel lonely even if you're not aware of it or if you are aware of it. When was the first time that you realized that you were actually feeling lonely? Yeah, I remember that. But let's talk about that in the next topic. So this story starts a bit crazy, but it ended up with me having a conversation that drastically changed my life and gave me a lot of insights into both empathy and loneliness. I was going to a personal development seminar. This was three years ago, and one of my biggest role models came to Stockholm. Her name is Till Swan, and she is doing YouTube videos on spirituality, psychology, and relationships. And I really like her stuff, so I've been watching her videos now for five years. So when she came, I was, I was really excited. And there was a lot of people at this seminar. There was probably 300 people in that room. And the way her workshops are structured is that she asks if anyone has a question, you raise your hand. And if you get picked, you get to go up and do a live coaching slash therapy session with her. And I was there and I didn't really have a question and there wasn't really anything on my mind in my life at that point that I wanted to do therapy on, like especially in front of 300 people. <laughs> uh, but I'm you know, into personal development and I want to push my comfort zone. So I raised my hand anyway, because I figured, hey, there's 300 people here. What is the chance that she will pick me? If I raise my hand, at least I will appear to be you know, someone that pushes my comfort zone, but I can just safely sit here in the back and watch other people on stage talk about their problems like human guinea pigs. But then, as maybe you can <laughs> see it coming, she said, hey, you there in the back, red shirt. And I'm like, shit, that's me. <laughs> I went from being in cozy observer mode to being the human guinea pig. <laughs> and you know, now everything has become surreal. And I'm like, okay, so I'm standing up. And now I start shaking and I'm walking towards the stage and I realize, whoa, I've never been on a stage in front of 300 people before. Like, how, how is this going to work? And when I walk up the small staircase to the stage where she's sitting, I just look out in this sea of people and I, the spotlights are on me and now I'm, getting, now I'm getting really nervous and I'm, I'm literally shaking. And uh, I sit down on the chair next to Teal and she says, uh, hi. And uh, she's very, you know, charming and attractive and welcoming, but also intimidating. Like it feels like she just sees right through my soul. 
And it's also so surreal because I've seen her, you know, weekly for five years now. I feel like I know her. I feel like she's a good friend of mine. I feel like I know her psyche and her backstory and she feels so familiar. But I'm a total stranger to her. And that's just like this weird dynamic. And I'm so uncomfortable. And I try to, you know, appear cool or maybe become a bit less comfortable by, like I make some jokes and stuff in the beginning. And, you know, I've seen the video of this and looking back, I can see that she's like laughs at my jokes and stuff, but she's mostly like playing along with me, you know? Um, yeah, but anyway, I, I sit down and then like I start shift a little bit in my energy and she says, um, so, so how can I help you? And I go, yeah, shit, I don't have a question. Um, what do I want to talk about? And then from my subconscious somewhere comes the question, I never feel lonely. Is there something wrong with me? And I really don't know why I asked that question. It's such a random question. And I honestly don't think that she really understood that question. It is a pretty random question. So instead, she started asking me a lot of stuff about my childhood, about my parents, about my ex-relationships and kind of what problems I had run into there and the conflicts that I ended up in. And yeah, she kept digging in me with questions. And whenever I answered, she looked disappointed and she tried again and it felt like she was fishing for something. Uh, but I just didn't know what she wanted from me. It, I, I felt stupid and like, yeah, I, and I could tell she got more frustrated when I didn't give her the answers that she wanted. And after a while, she just got fed up and said, hey, you know what your problem is? You're not being vulnerable enough for me to care about you. Mm -hmm. You're not being vulnerable enough for her to care about you. What do you think she meant by that? I honestly had no idea. I, I heard that word vulnerability being thrown around in like personal development context. But I never really understood what that looked like in practice. And that's why I couldn't give it to her on the stage. Do you think you know? Yes, I think. Vulnerability is such an interesting word. It's it's like empathy. It's like this big and complicated word, uh, but it's also very important to to understand it. So I, I think I know what she meant. And so let's tie it back to the metaphor before of watching a movie and seeing the hero and feeling along with the hero. And now think of some nameless actor extra in the same scene as the hero. And that uh, character just dies, gets shot or whatever. How do you feel when that happens? Not much. Not much. But if the hero would die, you would feel a lot. And the difference between the hero and the extra is that you've gotten to know the hero. You've gotten to see the hero's struggles You know what the hero wants. You have seen the pain of the hero. So then you can connect emotionally with the hero. So you care about them. But you know nothing about the extra. You haven't seen the extra struggles. You don't know what they want. You don't know who they are. So when they disappear, it doesn't mean anything. And the difference here is vulnerability. Like, if you are not able to share how you are feeling, the struggles you've been going through, the emotions that you have, what's actually important to you, it becomes very hard for her to care about you. It becomes right. like she's talking with an extra. She can't emotionally connect with you. And the difference here is, is vulnerability. So I'm assuming that you answered her from maybe like a very logical way. You might explain how yeah. something looked or what your theory was about something. Yeah. But you didn't tell her about the feelings that you felt. Maybe you told her about something your father did, but you didn't mention 
the shame or guilt you felt when your father said that. So it became, it's a different story here when you're explaining maybe what happened, but not how you felt about it. So that's the difference with the hero and the extra. You know the feelings of the hero. Okay, so let's see if we can tie this together with the story you shared earlier about when your ex-girlfriend said that she hated sex. Mm -hmm. Let's say that when you came there and when she didn't want to have sex, if you were vulnerable with her and shared with her what you were feeling, what would you have said? Uh, I think I would have tried to show her my story over the last year when she's been away, how I had been more and more afraid that I would lose her because our life would separate too much. Maybe there, there was pain and jealousy in me that I was worried she would meet someone new. I was worried she would stop loving me and I loved her very much. That's why I worried, worried so much. Uh, I didn't want that to happen. And I wanted us to have sex because that would be like a proof that she still loved me. And I wanted that proof because I felt insecure. So you would have told her that the reason you want to have sex is because you're seeking that proof. And that would have been the truth. But then I don't know yeah. if I would have been brave enough to say it because then I would feel like needy and insecure. And maybe that's why vulnerability was scary in the first place. Yeah. So the way this story played out was that she got furious and screamed at you that she hated sex. Yeah. If you would have said this, what do you think would have happened? I actually think she would have been real sweet with me. Maybe she would have told me that she do love me. And maybe she would have taken it more into consideration that it's hard for me to be that far away from her. Maybe we could have had a really good conversation. And maybe that which I sought, which was more secured in our relationship, could have happened. But maybe without needing to have the sex to get there. And you probably would have ended up having sex because she would suddenly feel connected with you. Yeah, that's probably what was lacking. Yes. But what I thought happened is that she just doesn't like having sex with me because I'm bad or something. But she, yes. yeah, it was the connection. It probably was the connection. And either way, it's our society is so focused on like being man and being cool and being strong. And we think that that's what we're supposed to do. Well, explaining what you're really feeling, that's how you become the hero in the movie. That's yeah. how you become the person that people care about. And that's how you connect. And that's a very big part of empathy. Yeah. So I can see that I had never done that in my whole life. So when I was on stage with Teal, I didn't show anything of how I was feeling. So that's why she said, you're not vulnerable enough for me to care about you. Yeah. Another important insight I got from this conversation was that she said, apart from me not being vulnerable, she said, I don't feel like you care about my feelings. That's powerful. So she didn't feel that you cared about her. Did you understand what she meant by that? Not then. I mean, I was pretty shook up at that point because those are quite hard, harsh words, right? To hear from a therapist that you also look <laughs> up to a lot that she don't care about me and I don't care about her. I had no idea I was sending that out, if that makes sense. Yeah. So let's let's take it back to the situation with with your ex again. When... She said that she hated sex. Did you ask her any questions about how she was feeling at the time? No. Did you think about how she was feeling? No. So, this is another part of, of empathy. It is the willingness to connect and being curious that... 
if you don't ask her any question and you don't give her any space to share, she will not feel that you care. And I'm just assuming, especially being on stage with with Teal, you were so focused on your own experience that there were no space for her experience. Yeah, yeah. I was in too much shock and confusion and pain at that point. And that makes perfect sense, Yeah, especially in that extreme setting. But she probably picked up that this was something that happened frequently then in your life. And it sounds like it, it was. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think a combination of me not knowing how to understand what she felt or a lack of showing curiosity. But also that I just didn't think enough about what was this like for her. I was too stuck in my own experience. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a big part about learning empathy. It's learning both of these sides. Learning how to share, but also how to want to know. Yeah. Yeah, so those were two huge wake-up calls for me. I'm not being vulnerable enough for her to care about me. And also she doesn't feel that I care about her. And after this one-hour conversation, she told me, after working with you, honestly, you're not ready to be in a relationship. How did that feel? Harsh. But it felt true. And when I I left the workshop that day and I went home, I was exhausted. And I think when I lay down on the couch that night, it was I actually felt lonely. <laughs> I felt like, shit, I can't connect with people. I do feel lonely. And yeah, there, <laughs> there's something wrong with me in a sense. I haven't learned this. And um, it was so transformative because I decided after that that I need to learn this skill. I can see that that conversation changed your life. So when was the first time you realized that you felt lonely? So my story is a lot less dramatic uh, than yours and still somewhat similar. So I was having lunch with with two of my friends, um, I don't know, maybe three years ago. And we ended up in this deep and meaningful full conversation. And one of my friends asked me, do you feel that anyone understands you? And I got taken aback by that question. And I remember sitting silent for a little while and realizing, no, I don't feel that anyone understands me. And I think just saying that was probably a pretty similar experience as you had when you lied down on the couch there. Like I think I felt mm-hmm. lonely in this moment. Like I'd been in a relationship for seven years with my girlfriend. And still when someone asked me if anyone understands me, I couldn't say yes. Wow. And I think I connected the dots there that, okay, something is clearly wrong here. I'm supposed to be be understood. And if I'm if I'm going back there with like my insights from now and from this conversation, and I'm asking if he instead would ask me, do you feel that you really understand someone else? I think the answer would have been no as well. And I don't think I had that curiosity. I don't think I really cared about other people's experiences and really tried to understand them. I was totally busy with my own life and my own worries. So yeah, this was my wake-up call. Like after this, I realized, yeah, in a less dramatic way than you, but still I realized, okay, no one understands me. And I started thinking about more and more about, okay, why doesn't anyone understand me? And one insight that I had was, that's my fault. Like, it's easy to think that, oh, it's my girlfriend. She's supposed to understand me. But there is no way in hell she can understand me if I'm not doing a very conscious effort of explaining me. And explaining me is vulnerability. If I don't tell her all the things that I'm feeling, 
all the wants I have, all the desires, all the shame, all the guilt, or what, all whatever things spinning around inside of me, she can never understand me. That's like asking her to understand a movie without seeing the scenes. So I had a lot of thinking about this. I read books, I listened to podcasts, I did all kinds of things, trying to understand how to communicate me. Yeah, I can relate to that so much. After I had my wake-up call, I just wanted to read a lot of books and listen to a lot of podcasts and try to figure out, you know, how can I communicate me in a way that people understand and care more about other people. I love how similar we are. In this. Yeah, we had it was the same time frame, but on our own. Like, yeah, yeah, right. And for you listening, maybe you hear this, and maybe you are having a wake up call right now. So check in with yourself. Ask yourself one: Are you being vulnerable enough for other people to care about you? Do you feel like someone understands the full you and what's going on inside? And two. Do you feel like you understand other people? Are you curious? Do you care about the emotional experiences that they are having? And if you realize that you don't, you also got work to do. But Eric, like, where can someone start then if they're having a wake-up call right now? So one great place to start is by understanding a concept called the four stages of competence, which can be applied to any skill. Out there. You always go through these different four steps from being a complete beginner at something to being really good at something. It applies to every skill. And the four different steps, and I'll explain these a bit more in detail, are unconscious incompetence, conscious incompetence, conscious competence, and unconscious com- competence. Yeah. That's the four. <laughs> it's really hard words. Either way, let's go through them and look at it from the case of driving a car. So in the first step, unconscious incompetence. Tricky word. That basically means that you're not even aware of how hard something is, or you're not aware of that you can't do it. So that would be me being 15-year-old thinking, driving a car is easy. Like Exactly. Anyone but you haven't even it. tried it. Yeah. Yeah. And then the next step is conscious incompetence. That's when you start understanding how hard something is and you can't do it. I sit down in the car and I can't even start it or accelerate. And, exactly. Yeah. Suddenly you know about this skill and you know how hard it is and you know it can't. Yeah. The third step is conscious competence. And it means that you can do something, but you really need to focus. You really need to be aware when you are doing it. Right, right. I can take a roundabout, but I really need to pay attention so I don't crash into any other car. Exactly. And the fourth step is unconscious unconscious competence. Really difficult work. They should have been given this a better <laughs> naming structure. Anyway, well, it's a good letter. Yeah, and it's on Wikipedia. You can go and read about it. <laughs> unconscious competence. And that's when you are, you do it so well, you don't even need to think about it anymore. It just happens automatically. Right, so that would be me in the roundabout, eating McDonald's, talking to a friend, fixing the stereo, and yeah. yeah and still knowing the directions. Yes. Like, without even thinking about it, you suddenly drive the car. So these are the four different stages that you go through with any knowledge. Um, and it applies to empathy as well. Right, so you want to go from you don't even know that you're bad to you're so good that you don't even have to think about it. Yes. So for you listening to this, if you recognize the different symptoms of loneliness that we spoke about before, that you rarely share about your own feelings with your spouse or with your friends or family, that people rarely comes to you to share about their feelings. And maybe you keep your mind busy a lot. Either you're just working a lot or you play a lot of video games, watch a lot of TV, watch a lot of porn. Maybe you work out obsessively. If you are rarely in a state when you're just in silence, but instead keeping your mind busy a lot, it's very likely that you are in the first stage, the unconscious incompetence, and that this can be your wake-up call. So, Emmet, what does what did the first stage look like for you, the unconscious incompetence? For me, that was my whole life. 
up until the moment on stage with Teal. You know, all the conflict, like I talked about in my previous relationships, came from me not knowing that I was bad at empathy. And you didn't even know it was a skill to be good at. Yeah, no idea. No idea. Yeah. So that was the first stage, unconscious incompetence. Yeah. So the second step is conscious incompetence. When did you get there? Okay, so that started on a day of the seminar. I realized that there is a skill called empathy and I'm bad at it. So I want to get better at it. And I started reading books and podcasts and learning all of these skills and techniques and what vulnerability is and how to express my feelings better. All the stuff that we're going to spend the next four topics of this podcast to talk about. And I started learning and practicing, but it took some time until I could even do it while I was paying a lot of attention to it. Yeah, yeah, because it so, was a complicated thing. Yeah, so maybe that was the next year or so of my life when I put quite a lot of effort into learning this skill. Yeah, I can imagine there on stage you realized, hey, I'm bad at something. Yes. You probably didn't even really understand that it was empathy. Yeah. That took some time to get there. Okay, so that was the second stage. So the third stage, the conscious competence. What mm -hmm. did that look like? That for me would be maybe the last two years of my life where I learned these skills, but I have to pay a lot of attention to to use them. You know, when I'm in a conversation, I'm really, you know, trying to understand and I reflect a lot on, on my behavior afterwards. And a lot of the time I miss it. And I realize afterwards, that, ah, here I should have done that. And ah, that's where I failed to be empathic. Yeah, so you can do a lot of techniques and be aware of them, but it takes your attention to be there. Yes, exactly. And I can imagine it gets awkward every now and then. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So the fourth stage then, the con unconscious competence. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? I think a, a real good example is the letter you talked about in the beginning of this episode. So maybe you can take a look at that again, but give some more context. Sure, I'll give you some more context because it's it's a bit of a weird story. So this was a few few months ago, and me and my fiance Johanna had had a pretty rough couples therapy session that kind of stirred up a lot of emotions in me. And as any healthy adult, I turned to Facebook for support. <laughs> <laughs> I actually did, um, which comes to vulnerability. Like I, I wanted to share with the world that I was in pain and that I wanted support. So I wrote uh, a message on Facebook basically saying that, hey guys, I feel that I need emotional support right now. I've had a rough couples therapy session. And if you ever had a good experience with me, please send me a message and tell me about it. And that's where this message came from. And I'll read it again. So once again, this was from, from a woman that I met on a trip to Netherlands. And we met at a retreat called Primal. And she wrote, Hey Eric, I'm not sure if you remember me. We were at Primal together. I wanted to share my memory of you because it meant the world to me. It was your reaction when I shared my personal story. Your presence was so pure, honest, and still welcoming. You were holding the space for me so perfectly calm and still somehow showing me that you wouldn't rather be anywhere else in that moment. I think that for the first time in my life, I felt what it was like having somebody just there for me. You gave me a hug in the end, and I felt so understood and seen. It still brings tears to my eyes when I go back there. Thank you so much for giving me this experience. I do my best not to settle for less since then. And I'm eternally grateful to you for this. Mm. So this is a powerful message and it, it really moves me. And I'm definitely not at stage four all the time, but I'm at stage four sometimes. And this was one example of that. 
And I got several other messages like this. And as I said in the introduction, and I might sound arrogant saying it, but I barely remember this conversation, which ties in then to unconscious competence. Like, I didn't use any techniques. I don't remember trying anything. I just remember being there, and apparently I did everything right from an empathy perspective. So I wasn't aware. I wasn't thinking. I didn't try. I was just driving the car in the roundabout, eating a burger, talking, (laughs) basically. (laughs) And yeah, I think that's, that's beautiful to be at this level when it happens. It shows how powerful that is. Because if I'm looking at my own stages, like for the first seven years of my relationship with, with Johanna, I was also at stage one. I had no idea that I didn't know about empathy. And I avoided all difficult conversations, just like you did. And I didn't understand her And as I told you, seven years into that relationship, I didn't feel that she understood me. And we ended up breaking up as a consequence of that, which was a part of my journey. It happened pretty, at a pretty similar time as when I realized that no one understood me, that I felt lonely in that. So I was apparently lonely in my relationship. And I spent the next couple of months understanding that pain and starting to really want to do something about it. And I realized I really want to be with her and I didn't know how. So we got back together and I got on a long journey of personal growth, reading books, learning this, and somehow understanding along this journey, like, okay, I'm not good at sharing what goes on within me. I'm not good at listening to her. I'm not good at communicating about this. So my stage two was like the first year in our second relationship. And I learned more and more and we got better and better at communicating. And now it's five years ago since we broke up. We've been a couple for 12 years in total. And I never avoid difficult conversations with her. I haven't done for years, which means that we have had a ton of really painful conversations like horrible conversations, but they've been very meaningful and bonding and deeply honest. And the result of that has been magical because I feel zero need of playing any games with her. Like I never hide anything that I feel. I might not bring it up the second it happens because it might be bad timing, but I bring everything up. Like there are no stones that we don't turn over to see what's underneath them. And it makes me feel such ease in my body to be around her now. Like there used to be a lot of tensions, a lot of frustrations, a lot of things that were just living underneath the surface. But now she is my, she's my home. Like she she really feels like home. She feels like being around her It's the same feeling as I've had if I've been out traveling for business or whatever, and I finally come home and I lie down on my couch. That feeling of just, ah, that's how I feel in her presence. And that comes from a lot of practice, a lot of time on stage three, and glimpses of stage four. Yeah, that's how it is. Wow, that is such a powerful journey you have taken from stage one to stage stage four. And I hope those listening would be inspired to do something similar. Well done, Frodo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gandalf. <laughs> Ooh, I'm Gandalf. So how about I summarize uh, this topic? Please go ahead. All right. So there are four stages of empathy. The first one is when you're not even aware that you are bad at the skill at empathy. And that could be you if you realize that you're not that good at understanding other people. You don't feel like other people really understand you because you don't know how to be vulnerable. And you have a lot of behaviors that keep your mind busy. And if you realize that's you, maybe this is a wake-up call for you. And you can go into the second stage where you need to start learning 
how you can start being good at empathy. And that is what the next four topics of this episode is all about. So we got you covered with that. <laughs> Stage three is when you start to understand how to do this, but it's not really effortless yet. And stage four is where you start having these magical effects on all the people around you. And yeah, you can really use that to transform your personal life and your business life to the highest level, thanks to empathy. Beautiful summary. Thank you very much. Let's, Let's... move on. I said it first. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to the third topic, which is behaviors that block empathy. Ta-da. Dun, 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 dun. I remember about two years ago, uh, you and I were sitting at a rocky beach in Malta. And I was telling you about some difficult relationship challenges that I was going through. I sat there just staring out at the sea. And you were just quiet next to me. I remember looking back at you and you looked back at me with, no particular expression in your face. And I remember staying silent and you just stayed silent. And I have this feeling that when we walked home from that beach, I felt lighter. Like nothing had changed. Nothing was better with my relationship issues. I hadn't gotten any solutions to anything. But somehow I felt lighter. Remember this? Yeah, I remember this day. So I think it's it's fascinating how much can be accomplished with so little. Yeah. So what happened there? To me, what happened was just empathy. And we define empathy as sharing someone else's emotional experience. And I think that's what happened. I listened to you. I was really curious, but I didn't have to do so much. And I felt along with you. I listened to your story. When I heard about your pain, I used my imagination to feel some of that pain as well. And we connected in that moment. So how was this experience for you? I remember that the more I listened to your story the more I found myself in a similar state of mind as if I was watching a movie, like we talked about earlier in this episode. I followed along with the main character in your story, which was you, and I could feel and share some of the emotional experience that you were going through. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. But won't the conversation need more participation on your behalf? Doesn't it feel weird when just some one person is talking? I would say most conversations need a bit of back and forth, and it usually makes a conversation better. But it depends a lot about what the topic is. And in general, the more emotional and sensitive a topic is, the better it is that you put yourself in this listening state, almost like you're watching a movie. For example, if you're talking about something very painful, it becomes more important that I don't jump in and interrupt your story. Or if you talk about something happy, like you just got a promotion, then it's more important that I let you finish than if we're just chit-chatting, talking about everyday stuff. Okay, so the more emotional a topic is, the more important it is to be in a state of empathy and watch that movie instead of changing the channel. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So you could say that my story holds my emotional experience. And if you listen to my story, you will feel my emotional experience. Yeah, exactly like that. I like that. Yeah, and for you listening, this topic is all about the behaviors that we do that block empathy. You know, everything that prevents us from having that experience, like we're watching a movie and we're following along with the emotional experience of another person. And there's a lot of these behaviors, so we have divided them into categories. In this topic, you will learn what the main goal of empathy is, and then you will learn about three common misunderstandings that many of us do that prevents us from empathy. 
And this will then be the first step in the ladder. So you will start noticing, okay, I have these behaviors or other people have these behaviors. Yes. So you can go from not being aware that you don't know to at least being aware that you don't know. Yes. And even if you're higher up in the ladder, maybe this is a reminder that, whoops, I still do these things. <laughs> yes. So what's the main goal of empathy? The main goal of empathy is to pay attention to the emotional experience behind the story. The main goal of empathy is to pay attention to the emotional experience behind the story. So that would mean that when I'm telling you the words of my experience, your main goal is to focus on what I'm feeling behind those words rather than maybe the words alone. Yes, exactly. I want to be able to feel along with you and I want to give you the opportunity to feel along with you as well. Okay, so we both want to be able to focus on my, in this case, emotional experience. Yes, exactly. And that's when empathy will happen. Exactly. Okay. And you said there were three main mistakes or misunderstandings that stops this from happening. Yes. What is the first misunderstanding? The first common misunderstanding is that when someone is in pain, it's important that we make them feel better. When someone is in pain, it's important that we make them feel better. Okay, that sounds like we should make people feel better. Why is this a misunderstanding? It's a misunderstanding because it's counterintuitive. Okay. It's, it's very easy to misunderstand this because we've been told since we were toddlers that if we're sad, our parents tell us, no, don't, don't cry, don't yeah. be sad, right? So we see it from our parents and... So many of us think being a good friend means making someone feel better. Okay, so when we were kids, whenever we were sad, it was common that we got distracted. Someone put a toy in our hand and we yes. learned that way that sadness was something that should go away as fast as possible. Yes, exactly. Okay, but why shouldn't sadness go away as fast as possible? Because... Sadness and all other difficult emotions like anger, frustration, they serve a purpose. If we allow them to be there and we allow ourselves to feel them, they will often pass faster and more naturally, but we can also learn from them. We can learn why we're sad, why we're angry. And this is crucial to develop emotional intelligence. Okay, so this is what happened in the story on the beach, that I was sad and you didn't try to change anything. Yes. But still, I felt better. Yes, and I didn't try to change it because I see your sadness as valuable. You and it's important that I help you feel it. You see my sadness as valuable, and it's important that you help me feel it. So what would happen if you instead distracted me from it? If we just did something else, wouldn't I feel better then? You think that it feels like the sadness goes away, but what happens is that you suppress the sadness. It's still there, but you can't really feel it anymore. It's like you're swiping it under the carpet. Okay, so I would not feel the sadness for a while, but then it would probably come back. Yes, and this is so common, this misunderstanding. We all think that to be a good friend means distracting people out of their sadness, but what it means to be a really good friend, an empathic friend, is to send the message that your sadness is important and your sadness is welcome here. Your sadness is important and your sadness is welcome here. I like that. So what behaviors does this misunderstanding lead to? Right. So first, I want to say that we all do these behaviors with the best of intentions. Yeah. We want the other person to feel better and that is a good thing. But when we think we need to make someone feel better, we fail at the main goal of empathy, which is to pay attention to the emotional experience behind the story. So let's say that you're sad and I try, I try to cheer you up, which is a common behavior that breaks empathy. What happens is if I say, don't be sad or don't worry about that, and you stop being sad and you stop worrying, is that you are no longer paying attention to the emotional experience in the story you're going through. And I'm not lo any longer 
paying attention to the emotional experience behind the story. It's like we start watching another movie. Okay, so we fail at the main goal. When you say, tell me, don't be sad, you are bringing my attention elsewhere. It also feels like I'm not allowed to be sad. Yes, I'm But, invalidating your problem. Yeah, because when I feel sad, I, I, I want to feel sad to some extent. And it feels like if you tell me don't be sad, it feels like there is something wrong with me when I'm sad. Yeah, I'm subtly sending the signal that you shouldn't be sad right now. There's something wrong about feeling sad. Or maybe even that your problem is not big enough for you to feel sad. Like, let's say you were sad because your dad died. I would never try to take you out of that sadness or no, cheer you up, true. right? But where does the line go? Yeah. I think what a really good friend does, an empathic friend, is to send the signal that, hey, it's okay that you're sad. And I would probably be sad if I was in your situation too, because I understand your story, the emotional experiences behind it. Yeah. Or at least I want to understand. Yeah, and as you said before, your sadness is important and welcome. Yes. And if my sadness is important, she would never say, don't be sad. Exactly. Yeah. And this is why sharing someone up, don't be sad, don't be worried, counterintuitively, is a misunderstanding that blocks empathy. Okay. So, so what about if you, instead of sitting there by the beach, if you said, hey, let's go grab an ice cream or something, would that be the same kind of thing then? Yes. Yes. Because we're stopping your story. Yeah. We're no longer paying attention to the emotional experience behind your story. Now we're eating ice cream instead. And we have swiped the problem under the carpet. Yeah. Same for, would be for any behavior, you know, that distracts us from the story. Yeah. So with the best of intention, you would like me to feel better. The problem is that the best way to make someone feel better is to let them feel bad for a while, but feel supported while feeling bad. Exactly. And again, we all do this with the best of intentions. Let's say you had a you broke up with your girlfriend and you were really sad. I might try to be a good friend by saying, don't be sad over her. Let's go out and have some drinks. You can meet someone else. And yeah. we think it's helping, but it's distracting you from your emotional experience. And I'm saying, you can't be sad with me. Yeah. Those feelings are not welcome here. Feel better so I can feel better. Yeah. Okay. So the first misunderstanding was... Your pain, it's important to take someone away from their pain. And that created these behaviors. So what is the second misunderstanding? Before we go to the second one, I want to add something to the first misunderstanding, which is when someone is in pain, it's important that I make them feel better. And that is that the same thing applies to the relationship we have with ourselves. It's so common that when we feel sad, worried, upset, That we tell ourselves stuff like, ah, don't worry about that, or that's nothing to be sad about. Yeah. And then we do the same thing with ourselves. <laughs> we send ourselves the signal that, hey, my pain is not important. I shouldn't feel this way. Ah, uh, yeah, I can see I've done that a lot. Like, yeah, it's so common. Oh, why am I angry about this little thing? Or yeah. I can't do anything about this. Why why bother? Yes, exactly. And just ignoring my own my own feelings there. So it's So to be a good friend to ourselves, we want to say, we want ourselves to feel like, okay, my sadness or my anger or whatever it is, is important and it's welcome. Yes. Definitely. And then hold the space for that, listening to that pain with curiosity in the same way as we would with someone else, trying to understand it. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, I can see that's being very important. With that said... Let's move on to the second common misunderstanding, which is when someone's story gives me an idea, it's important that I share it. When someone's story gives me an idea, it's important that I share it. Yes, and this is both tricky and counterintuitive because we all get good ideas all the time when we listen to stories. When I sat there on the rocky beach in Malta and I listened to you, I wish I could say my mind was just blank and I was completely absorbed, but I had thoughts and associations all the time. Maybe there was an ice cream truck coming by and I thought, hey, let's get some ice cream. 
or maybe your relationship story reminded me of something that I've been through. And maybe I had ideas that could help you or that I want to share and jump in with at that moment. But it's important that we don't share these ideas. And this is counterintuitive, but here's why. Remember, what was the main goal of empathy? (laughs) So the main goal of empathy is to have the focus on the emotional experience uh, behind the story. Yes. And if you tell your story, but then I jump in and talk about something from my life, what happens? We shift the focus from my emotional experience to yours. Yes. So it seems like a good and relevant thing to do, but we are failing with empathy because we're taking the focus away from your story. And that would be the same if it was the ice cream truck or a joke or or anything. Like whatever you're doing that takes mine and your attention elsewhere will break the empathy. Yeah, yeah. That happened to me once. Oh, that reminds me of something. Okay, but let's say you've had a similar life experience, which is is very relevant, and you have good advice for me. Shouldn't you say that? Ooh, this is the trickiest of the trickiest part. And this is something I talk with almost all of my coaching clients with, about should you give advice? Should you help solve someone's problem? And the answer is, it depends. Okay. Know, it's so important that if we want to give advice or give solutions to problems, that's okay, but we need to do it in the right timing. Because imagine you're telling the story there. You're in the rocky beach. You talk about something that is hard for you. Maybe you're sad. What would it feel like for you if I jumped in and said, hey, I've been through that. Here's what I did. This worked for me. What would that be like for you? So I think it depends on where I am and what kind of advice it would be like i can see if if i'm emotional i'm sharing this and then you share a story and you give advice that i've already tried for example then i need to explain that i've already tried it and i'm going to start telling you about how it was when i tried it so i will no longer be with my emotions and the original story so i can see that's one thing that could happen and i could also see that you give advice that I haven't tried, but that I think is bad advice. And I need to either argue with you about that advice and say why I don't like it, or I need to pretend to like it. Or once again, I'm I'm going away from my emotional experience and instead I'm arguing or debating or whatever. Yeah. Or I could also see that it's good advice, that it's like really relevant. But once again, it will take me out of my experience and I will start thinking about, okay, what happens if I do this? What about that? And all of these situations communicate to myself that the emotions isn't important. I'm going somewhere else. Yes. So that would break our connection, even if the advice is, well, if I've tried it, if it's bad or if it's good, all of these things will take me out of the story. Yes, exactly. It also kind of breaks the first misunderstanding as well. When we said when someone is in pain, it's important to make them feel better. We often give advice because we want the other person to feel better. But it's again suddenly invalidating the person's problem. We're saying, don't feel sad right now. Instead, do this so you get out of the sadness. And then we break this empathic state. Yeah, I can see that. So, but what if I have really good advice to give? Um, Should I never give it? So... Imagine this. Imagine that we sat on that rocky beach in Malta. I let you talk about what made you sad and you got to express your feelings fully. And you started feeling lighter, like you said, when you yeah, told like the story. Yeah, like when we were walking home. Yeah. yeah, and then we're walking home. You feel like, I felt my sadness. I feel lighter now. Imagine then if I said, hey, your story made me think of some ideas that I think could help you. Would you like to hear them? Yeah, it would be much easier to receive them then. Yes, And I would probably have more energy to deal with it. I wouldn't feel that I was taken away from my experience. Yes, and I asked you for permission. And yeah, it would be so much easier for you to take in that advice. And also, that gives me some more room to understand, is this advice really relevant for you? Because maybe if I let you keep telling your story, I hear that, oh, he already thought of that. Or maybe that advice that I thought was so important at first 
I understand that no, it's actually not important because I got more information later in the story. Okay, so advice can be good, but don't jump in with it. Yes. Timing is crucial, both because I might have tried it already. So we'll, the only thing we will do is to break the empathy, but advice will be useless. Yes. Or you will learn during my story why that advice wouldn't be good for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if you share it with me later on, I will be in a much better emotional space to to take it in. Yes. So would you, you said ask for permission. That means that would you like say, do you want advice or do you want my perspective? What do you mean when you say ask for permission? Yes, any of those would work. So yeah. instead of assuming that I know what you need from me, I ask, you know, okay, so right now, would you need, I have some ideas here. Would you like to hear them or would you prefer just to, just for me to listen? So yeah. I don't assume I know best what you need right now. I actually ask you what you need. Yeah, I can see that being very common. And I can see that I've so many times been just wanting empathy like one thing that comes to me is that I've had a lot of problems with my stomach all my life. And just if I said I have stomach pain in various situations, I just want to address that because I want to, like, I'm not at my peak level. I'm not in a good mood. And then people start giving me advice straight away. Have you tried this? Have you tried that? Because yeah. everyone has a relationship to what you should do to fix the stomach. And the only thing I want is like, I want you to be aware that I'm in pain. So if I'm not at my best mood right now, then... That's fine. Yeah. Like, I want you to know that. That's why I'm telling you. But always get a thousand advice. You and should go and see a doctor. I've been to 14 yeah, doctors. Yeah, exactly. I've been yeah. dealing with this for 20 years. Yeah. Like, please don't tell me what to do. I've tried it. I promise. But that's the thing here. Like, it's such a simple thing and it always triggers so much advice. Yeah. But if someone would say, oh, do you want, um, I, I'm, I've known a lot of, I've had a lot of problems with my stomach myself. Do you want advice? Do you want my tips? I could say, no, I think I've tried it all and I want to focus on this. I just want to know that I'm in pain. Yeah, I can see how frustrating it is when people want to fix your stomach problem. But again, people do it with the best of intentions. They genuinely want to help you. It's just that when it happens unsolicited and at the wrong timing, it just becomes frustrating for you. Yeah. So there's a much better way to do it. Yeah, so... Just to summarize the part about advice here, I think advice is good, but timing is everything. Yes. And it's better to not give advice than to give advice with the wrong timing. Yes. Because then empathy can be there and just hold space. And that's almost always better than advice to yes. just yes. be there for someone and feel there. Um, yeah. So is there something else about this misunderstanding before we move on? Yeah, I would say... Um Bigger mistake is any version of story topping. Okay, what's story topping? That could be, if you tell a story about your relationship problems, yeah. I naturally go into my mind, right? Then I start to think of similar situations that I experienced. Yeah. And then it's common to just take the biggest one and then share it. So I say, yeah, I understand you're sad about that, but you should hear this time when something even more sad happened yeah. to me. Yeah, so let's say what I was telling you about was, okay, me and my girlfriend, we haven't had sex for, I don't know, two weeks. And you would jump in. Yeah, that's nothing. Like when I was 22, my girlfriend screamed at me that she hated sex. Yeah. And suddenly my story is completely invalidated. Yeah. And we have no focus on my emotional experience at all. Yes. Yeah. I think a more subtle way this happens is it's more obvious when it's a negative, a negative experience thing. that this is not a smart thing to do but it also happens when someone shares a strong positive experience let's say you received a promotion and you're yeah. excited and you tell this story about your promotion and then I had received a promotion one month ago that was even better yeah. and then you tell this at a dinner and people like share you on and then I jump in and go like yeah I also got promoted one month ago yeah right it, it takes the attention away from your story. And especially if yours is bigger than, than before I felt good comparing myself with me. And yeah. now I would feel bad comparing myself with your progress. Yeah, I can see that I've done this so many times, especially like when my company was doing really well and I had friends running companies and someone told me about a progress they have had. And I started talking about a progress we have had that was m much bigger and how that, yeah, it stopped them from being allowed to be proud of their experience and just, yeah. 
yeah, it's just a shitty move. Yeah, and you are allowed to be proud of your experience, and you should be. But again, it's about timing. Like yeah. if someone just shares a success story, maybe you share your success story at the party know. next week instead, yeah. or at another moment, so you yeah. don't compete with their experience. Uh, I like that. So timing, it's fun. It's fun. It's fine to be proud and be happy about progress. Just don't spit it out there the second after someone else has shared something. Exactly. That's because right. it, it's very being proud is also a very emotional thing. Like you're you're vulnerable when you're proud. Because mm-hmm. uh, yes. you're explaining how you feel. Yeah, I like that. And again, empathy becomes more important the more emotional a situation is. That yeah. can be strong. Uh, difficult emotions and it can be strong positive emotions yeah. as well. It can then be sadness better. or proud pride or whatever. Yes, exactly. Okay. So what's the third misunderstanding? Right. So the first misunderstanding is that when someone is in pain, it's important that we make them feel better. The second misunderstanding is that when someone's story gives me an idea, it's important that I share it. And the third misunderstanding is that when someone is wrong, It's important that I let them know. When someone is wrong, it's important to let them know. So why is this a misunderstanding? Isn't truth important? It is a common misunderstanding because this, again, is counterintuitive. Yeah. But it is a misunderstanding because it breaks the first goal of empathy, the main goal of empathy, which is to pay attention to the emotional experience behind someone's story. Okay, so if we start arguing about who is right or wrong, we are no longer focusing on what's the emotions behind the story. Yes, exactly. Or why someone feel the way that they do. Yeah. And this is ex- especially common in relationship arguments and yeah, conflicts. I can see that. Yeah, and most arguments and conflicts is about determining who did something wrong. Right? Yeah. And you can usually know that when there is an argument, you're usually also not empathic at the same time. Yeah. And you're not focused on understanding the emotional experience someone else is having. No, because I want to be right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So let's let's pretend that you and I live together. Yeah. Right? And for me, it's important that the kitchen is clean. Every night before we go to bed, I want the kitchen to be clean. You don't care about if the kitchen is clean. You want to do it the morning after, if that. Four days later. Four days later, right? (laughs) Yeah. So who is right here? Me, definitely. (laughs) (laughs) Of course you're right. No, there is no right right or wrong. It's just preferences, right? Yeah. So if I think I'm right, I'm going to call you sloppy and disorganized. Yeah. And if you think you're right, you're going to call me obsessive and a neat freak. Yes, I'm going to start blaming you or judging you for that your behavior is is wrong. Yeah. And now we're arguing instead of understanding each other's emotional experience. So maybe I could ask you like what is it like for you if you feel like you have to clean the kitchen every night? Yeah, and I could think about like I'm really tired after working all day. It's it stresses me out. I don't think it's important. Like I I really don't care about it um so if i have to do it it makes me frustrated and i would much rather do it all at once on more rarer occasions than to do it before i go to bed right and if you ask me the same thing i might say that hey you know that the kitchen is clean is actually for me a proof that you value our house and our relationship and you want to invest energy there And if you can see that it's extremely important for me to feel loved in the relationship, that the kitchen is clean, maybe you start to think it's actually important because you don't care about the kitchen, but you care about what the kitchen means to me. Yeah, okay. So if you would say that it's important to me that the kitchen is is clean because I feel stressed if it isn't. Like looking at it makes me feel like I'm a bad human being. I'm raised that there's supposed to be a clean kitchen. Yeah then suddenly I understand why it's so important and it might become more important to me. Yes. Uh, Yeah, I can see that. But we're never going to get to that conversation if we start arguing about who is right. right. Yes. Because here we both acknowledge none of us is right. There isn't the right way to clean the kitchen. Yeah. But if we don't clean the kitchen, you will feel a certain way. If we do clean the kitchen every evening, I will feel a certain way. 
And by understanding what we will feel, we can then make decisions based on that rather than saying what's the right way to do something. Yes, exactly. Yeah, this uh, reminds me of a situation that happened I don't know, a month ago, something like that. When me and, and my fiance Johanna, we, we were talking about jealousy. She felt jealous about a thing that had happened. And I hugged her. And after that, the energy shifted completely. And she got really short with me and frustrated with me. And I, I didn't understand what happened. Like it was, a, it was a friendly conversation that we have had. It, there was nothing angry in that conversation. But after the hug, something happened. And I was just confused. And then I got frustrated because she was short with me. And I was like, I don't understand this. And why are you in a bad mood now? And so it kind of went on for a while. And then a bit later that, that evening, she asked me, why did you laugh at me? And I understood nothing. I was like, what are you talking about? Why did you laugh at me before? And I still understood nothing. And so she said, like, yeah, when, when we were hugging and I had told you about that, I felt jealous. You, you laughed at me. And I had not laughed at her. I at least had no memory of laughing, and I can't imagine that I did. And here it would be such an easy situation to just say, no, I didn't laugh. And she yeah. thinks that I laughed, and we would start arguing about whether or not I laughed. And what I told her was, like, I didn't say that she's wrong. I said, I have no memory of, of laughing, and I really don't think that I did. Uh, maybe I sighed or breathed, had a certain breath, I don't know. But then I understand why the energy shifted. Because yeah. if she told me she was jealous about something that happened and I laughed at her, that's a big difference between me just hugging her. Yes. Um, so she was still upset because she felt that I had laughed, but at least now we could connect I'm like, okay, if you la if you think that I laughed, I understand that you got frustrated. I understand that you felt angry with me because it would be a very disrespectful thing for me to do to laugh at you when you're being vulnerable about something painful. I really like that because what you do is you shift from the third misunderstanding, which is to think that you need to correct when something is wrong and start arguing. No, I didn't laugh. That's not what happened. And you shift to accomplishing the first, the main goal of empathy, which is to understand the emotions behind her story. Yeah, that's true. So her story is that Eric laughed at me, and now I must be in even more pain and jealousy. Yeah. Yeah. And you shift to try to understand that, and you shift back into empathy. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. And it, it's not important what actually happened. No. It's important what she feels and what I feel. That is the important part. And yeah, the, the more, again, we said it before that the more emotional a situation is, the more important it is that we don't make this third misunderstanding. The more emotional something is, the more important it is that we don't correct factual errors. <laughs> yeah. This happens between me and my girlfriend from time to time, and it drives me crazy. Like we can be in an argument, and I said, you know, last Saturday when this happened, and she jumps in and said, no, it was actually on Sunday that that happened. But it doesn't matter for the story. And I'm like, yeah, but now that took me out of my emotional experience. Okay, let me just see if I'm following along here. Okay, so you, you're telling a story about something. I say, you, you know this thing that happened last Saturday? And instead of letting you continue to just share what it was that happened, she said, it was Sunday. And then you kind of lose track of your own story for no real reason. Like it doesn't matter if it's Saturday or yes, Sunday. Yes, exactly. I go so up. she's technically right. Yeah. Like the, it was on Sunday, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And it just takes me out of my feelings and into my head and go, was it Friday? Was it? I can't remember the days of the week. Yeah. Or another one is uh, we speak English at home. And so I want her to correct me when I mispronounce stuff. But when I talk about something vulnerable and emotional, it drives me crazy when she interrupts to correct my English because it, it's, it's not the right timing to do that. It's a too emotional situation. Okay, so in general, you want her to help you become better in English because she's better in English than you are. Yeah. So if that would be regular dinner conversation and you mispronounce a word, you want her to say, this is how to pronounce it. Yes. But if that happens when you're sharing something emotional and she's just correcting you, then it takes you completely out of the emotional 
And even though she's technically right, you're supposed to pronounce whatever word in whatever way she said. Yes. It's irrelevant at that time. It's not the most important thing. So again, timing is so crucial. And if she would have been mindful of that there, she could just, ah, he mispronounced that word and just tell me later. Yeah. Right? It doesn't need to be right then and there. Yeah. And once again, it goes back to how emotional something is. Yes, exactly. Uh, so empathy, the more emotional a situation is, the more important it is with empathy. And the main goal of empathy is to keep the focus on the emotions behind the story. It sounds like we're getting a summary started here. Yeah. Can I continue? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> right. So then the first misunderstanding that makes us break the main goal of empathy is that when someone is in pain, it's important that I make them feel better. Yeah. The second misunderstanding is that when someone's story gives me an idea, it's important that I share that idea. And the third misunderstanding is that when someone is wrong, it's important that I let them know. Yes. And the main goal of empathy is to keep our focus on the emotional experience behind the story. And these misunderstandings lead to behaviors that prevent us from doing just that. So when we think that we have to take someone out of their pain, we invalidate their sadness, or we try to cheer them up, or we try to distract them. And we're not making them feel that the sadness is welcome. And we need the sadness to be welcome to heal. So sadness is important. And in the second misunderstanding, we give ideas when the ideas are not the important part. And once again, that takes the attention away from the emotional experience. We might share something that happened to us and it might feel relevant, but it's not as important as giving empathy. Or we give advice, which is a very common mistake. And advice are good, but timing is crucial. So if you give advice at the wrong timing, they often do a lot more harm than they are doing good. And the third misunderstanding is that when someone is wrong, it's important that we let them know. And truth is important. But once again, it's not the most important thing. And it often ends up with us arguing about how are we supposed to clean the kitchen instead of trying to understand why is it important for you to clean the kitchen? Or why is it important for me that we don't? Or did you laugh or didn't you laugh when we talk about jealousy? It's not that important. It's more important. What, what did you experience? How do you feel? So it's crucial that we don't focus on right or wrong it's more important that we focus on the emotional connection and what's behind the story. That was an excellent summer, Eric. How about we move on to the fourth topic, which is how we can give more empathy. Let's do that. Do you know that happy and energetic guy uh, at our gym? Yeah. The guy who always, you know, talks to everyone and spreads good energy. Yeah. Do you remember the conversation that you had with him in the sauna a couple of weeks ago after our jiu-jitsu class? Yeah. Can you tell me what happened there? Sure. So, yeah, you and I were in the in the sauna uh, after the jiu-jitsu class a few weeks ago. Um, and yeah, and this guy comes in. And as you said, yeah, he's always this happy, high, energetic guy, but I've never really spoken much with him. Um, he always says hi and does a lot of fist bumps with everyone. <laughs> uh, yeah, and he sat down and I think I asked him how he was. And yeah, he said that oh, life is good. Uh, he started talking a little bit about his, his new job. Uh, he's working in some restaurant and he mentioned that he wasn't sleeping well. Right. And how did you respond to that? Yes, I asked him why he wasn't sleeping well. Um, and he started sharing about a traumatic event that happened, I think it was 11 months ago, like last Christmas, something like that. Um, where he mentioned that his his son had out of nowhere gotten really sick. Um, I think his son was 11 or something like that. Um, and that they had to go to the hospital and wasn't sure that his 
his son was going to survive or not. Um, And yeah, I remember him shivering as he spoke about this. It was clear like this, this was scary shit. And he tied it back to, yeah, that he couldn't sleep because he was constantly in like alert mode in his body. Like whenever something happened, he felt his pulse going through the roof. And yeah, he was in panic mode whenever a small little sound, even though this was almost a year ago, or maybe it was more, I don't remember exactly. Yes, he told us and then um, he asked me how I was. Yeah, I remember this. And I was so impacted by the, his story. Like his legs were shaking when he told this. Yeah. And he said, yes, the bright light could remind him of the hospital. And then he couldn't sleep because he was <laughs> yeah. so traumatized from this experience. Mm-hmm. I wanted to bring this conversation up because I don't know if you thought about it. But I think the way you responded to him was a really high level empathic response. So I think like the first thing you did well there is when he asked how he was, he started talking about some happy stuff, right? How his new job at the restaurant. And then in the end, he mentioned, yeah, but I can't sleep. Yeah. And let's say that you were at a level one empathy there. How do you think you would have responded then? So I asked about the sleep because I felt that there was something more important there. Like that's probably where the struggles were if I would have been non-aware of looking for the emotional part of a conversation, I would probably have started talking about wine. He spoke about wine before because he was really happy with his new job because they had so many wines in this restaurant. And talking about his excitement about wine, which could have been a good way of doing it as well. Or start asking about what's the name of the restaurant? What is it that you like working there? And I don't think any of those would have been bad ways to continue that conversation. Um, But I think they were less likely to lead to a conversation where his legs were shivering and opening up a deeply emotional bond. Yeah. Yeah, and I really liked how you, because he asked how you were doing, but you didn't even respond to that question because you sensed there was something painful going on behind him not being able to sleep. Yeah, so what happened was after he had spoke for, I don't know, a few minutes, uh, he said something like, oh, yeah, yeah, but guys, uh, enough about my problems. How how about you? So this is a difficult situation because it's clearly that he is in a very emotional space. And him asking how about you is obviously an invitation for me to speak, but he's kind of sub-communicating I'm getting a bit uncomfortable having all the attention on me. You're supposed to talk now because that's kind of the social construct. You talk a little, I talk a little, especially when you don't know each other well and we really don't know each other well. So I'm not sure how I responded. What, What did I say? Yeah, I remember this. And this is why I brought this story up. Because he asked, how are you doing? So instead of responding to that, you said, and I think this is, I love this response. You said, I honestly don't know how what to say after the story you just told. Yeah, and then I just stayed silent, right? Yeah, you stayed silent for a while, and then you moved a little bit closer to him in the sauna. Yeah, You were right. sitting in the far end, and now you moved, like not right next to him, but a bit closer. Yeah, I moved so I could sit opposite yeah, of him. Yeah, and just looked at him, said nothing, and then he just kept talking. So you kind of gave him permission to ignore the social construct of I speak a little bit, you speak a little bit. And then he talked for another 15 minutes about yeah. how this experience had affected his family and his relationship with his son and his other son. And Yeah, exactly. So that's so he asked me how I was and I felt it was important to keep the attention on him. Uh, and one way... To do that would be to say, no, let's keep talking about you. And that would probably be, I would have done that a year ago. Like I, a year ago, I would have realized this is important to keep it on him, but I wouldn't really have known how to keep it on him in a smooth way. Yeah. Uh, while saying, and I didn't think about what I did here. So I don't necessarily remember exactly what I did, 
But looking back, I can see by saying, I don't know how to follow this. And I really didn't. Like, I can't talk. My life isn't that intense. Like, I haven't had that trauma. That I'm not in that trauma. So it makes no sense for me to start talking about whatever goes on in my life right now, right after that story. Yeah. Um, so my honest response was, I don't know how to follow this or something like that. And yeah, as you said, we were in two different sides of the sauna. It's a pretty big sauna at the gym. And I moved to sit, I don't know, maybe three meters away from him instead of seven meters and just right opposite him. And with my body language then inviting him to continue to speak. Um, and then I stayed silent for a while. And if he wouldn't have started speaking, I might have asked something or I might have done something else. But I, I don't think I even got to sit down again before he kept on talking. So it was clear to me that he wanted to continue talking, but he had asked the question more because of how a social dynamic is supposed to work. Yeah. Um, and yeah, as you said, he he kept sharing and it was beautiful to hear him talk about this because he described both the fear of, of losing his son, uh, but he also started talking about how this has um, brought their family closer together and how he have gotten a new, uh, new level of appreciation for um, the small things in life. Like one thing that I think was really beautiful that he said was, like one week after his son was back from uh, from the hospital, it felt like everything was normal again. And he could hear his two sons, so he had an, an older son and a younger son, uh, having some really meaningless uh, fight about something. And this was a situation where he would usually jump in and stop the fight. And now he was just enjoying listening to them <laughs> battling about whatever video game to play or something like that. And I thought that was so beautiful. Like it gives a completely new perspective on life, having that trauma. And you could see how his energy had shifted here from being in shivering fear to like arriving to some kind of happy state of mind within himself. Um, and I don't think he would have gotten there if I would have started talking about my day or if I would have taken the conversation elsewhere. He wouldn't have been able to deal with this emotional journey of getting from shivering fear to, I'm not sure if happy is the right way word, but at least a, a calmer place where his body has processed a lot of the difficult emotions. It's gratefulness. Yeah, gratefulness. I think this really shows the power of knowing how to listen empathically, because if you didn't have the skills, this would have just ended up being a regular conversation. But yeah. now this ended up being a conversation that he might only have with his very best friends, if yeah. that. Yeah. And so now all of a sudden you are in the category for him as one of his best friends because yeah. he had this experience with you. Yeah, and I think that's profound. And it's, I think it's extra profound since we barely know each other. Yeah. Uh, like we're starting from a place of barely knowing each other. And it's it's actually not that difficult to get this deep with people quickly if you know, A, if you know how to do it, and B, if there is a context where it's possible. So I mean, one thing that made this possible was that you didn't interfere. So if we would have been five random guys from the gym in that sauna at the time, now it was only you, me, and him. If it would have been five random guys, someone else would have interacted yeah. and someone else would have interfered. And it wouldn't have been that safe space of having this conversation. So it's it's more or less only possible when there is two people only or three people or four people where people know how to do <laughs> empathic conversations. But if you are two people, like if you're alone with someone, in my experience, it's pretty easy to get to this depth with yes. anyone. And I wanted to bring this story up because you said now you don't really remember what you did here. It kind of happened on autopilot. And the same thing happened in the first story we told in this episode about the woman you met at this retreat. Yeah. That I don't even remember this situation. I don't remember what I did. Yeah. So it means to me that it's a 
unconscious competence response. Yeah. It's a level four response where you just know what to do without needing to think about it. Yeah. But I also know that you got there by having some basic understanding of what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do. Because you said, yeah, I don't know. There was no way I could start talking about my story there. Yeah. But I know you feel that way. That's just a feeling. But yeah. I know you feel that way because you know that the main goal of empathy is to share someone else's emotional experience and try to understand the feelings behind their story. Yeah. And I know you have an understanding of which behaviors you shouldn't do. So with that theory, it's easier for you to know. Yeah, and an interesting insight that comes to me now when you re-describing this is I think a reason why I didn't start talking about my day or didn't respond in in another in another way was that I did have my focus so much on his emotional experience. So I was moved by him talking about this trauma. Yeah. Like if I wouldn't have been connected with his emotion, I would have thinking about what to say myself. I wouldn't have been in that emotional space. Yeah. But now I felt some of his trauma and I didn't feel like started talking about some Netflix show or whatever no. goes on in my life. I was in his emotional states. I felt his feelings to some extent. And yeah, once again, I wasn't aware of that. That's what I was doing. I didn't intentionally focus to feel what is he feeling right now. But I got into that um, emotional state because I was just listening. Yeah. So to make this even clearer then, let's take a look at what would have happened in this conversation if you would have been at level one in your understanding of empathic listening. So if I would have been at level one, I wouldn't even be aware of that there is something called empathy or empathic listening. Um, so I wouldn't have focused anything on his emotions and I wouldn't even know that it was important to focus on his emotions. Right. So when he started talking about wine or his new job, I would most likely have just interrupted him with whatever idea his talking about wine would be uh, or about his new job, probably with questions about wine or his job. Or, I love wine. Yeah, or maybe I'll start talking about my own stories and my own relationships with wine. So we wouldn't have gotten anywhere. We'd probably have a good conversation. He's a fun guy. He's a happy guy. We would have talked and had a good yeah. banter, but we wouldn't have gotten to any like real depth uh, it wouldn't be very meaningful. It would have been the same kind of conversation he has with everyone, but not the kind of conversation that he would remember. No, much nothing later. that would help him in any way. Um, so that's probably what would have happened. And even if I would have listened to everything that he said, and when he gets to the part about not sleeping, me as a father of a little one year old or soon to be one year old would probably have started talking about me not sleeping. Yeah. And I would probably say, I sleep even less because I have a child. Like, your kids are old, like minus one. I don't sleep. So that's probably where I would have taken the conversation then. Yeah. And once again, we wouldn't have gotten anywhere. And I would even have invalidated his sleep by saying, I sleep even less. It's yeah. more, you should feel sorry for me. I shouldn't feel sorry for you. Um, yeah, so that's probably how, how it would have played out. I think this whole situation is interesting. And the reason I brought brought it up is that to me, you responded to him from a level four in empathic listening, meaning you were at the unconscious competence stage. You didn't think about it. You just acted from a gut feeling, right? There's no, there was no logic in your mind going that, okay, he tells me, how are you doing? But he's clearly emotional. So I should then respond by saying, I don't know how to follow up on that and then move closer to him in the sauna. I can't imagine there were any logic no. like that happening. So it was no theory, just gut yeah. the response. So that's level four. But you also actually needed theory to get there. Because yeah. I know for years now, you've been working yourself up from level two to level three to level four. And during that period, you have been thinking about these concepts. A lot. A lot, yeah. You know that the main goal of empathy is to stay connected to the emotions behind the story. You know that you shouldn't interrupt. You know some other theories and techniques that we will talk more about in this topic. So at level four, you don't need the theory, but you did need the theory to get to level four. In the rest of this topic, for you listening, what we're going to look at are some theories that you can use to move up the ladder 
from level two to level three to level four. And there are four of them. The first one is to validate other people's feelings. The second one is to ask emotional questions. The third one is to guess how other people are feeling. And the fourth one is to feel your own feelings. And I know that Eric was using all of these concepts in this situation, but he was at level four at this point, so he didn't <laughs> even think of it. But previously, you would have done it yeah, more consciously, but not as smoothly. For sure. Right. So the first concept is to validate people's emotional experiences. And I saw that you did this in the sauna. Uh, can you think of a time? Okay, so to just explain what validate means to start uh, is, is to basically communicate, I understand you feel this way, or I would have felt the same way, or this feeling makes sense. Where the opposite would be, don't worry, don't be sad, your feelings are wrong. Which is the first misunderstanding. Yeah, exactly, which is part of the first misunderstanding. So one thing that happened here was that he told me about, or told us about all of this fear, even though there were no apparent danger anymore. His son was healthy. So he was afraid, he was worried. And what I did was, I think I said something like, yeah, if that would have happened to my son, I would still carry that fear as well. Yeah. So basically I say, your fear is completely natural. Where what I could have done would say, yeah, but don't worry, he's healthy now. Yeah. That would have been the opposite. So validating basically just says, communicates either verbally or just with my body language or whatever, like your feeling is correct. Yeah. That's what validating someone's feelings yeah. mean. The second concept is called emotional questions. What are those? Here's important to understand the difference between fact questions and emotional questions. So what I could have done would be asking him, what hospital did you go to? Or what disease did he have? That would be fact-based questions. And they don't really take you deeper into the emotional connection with someone. And the opposite of fact question then is emotional questions. That would be any way of asking him, how did he feel? What was going on inside of him? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Because if you ask him what disease did he had, he would go up in his head and start giving all these complex medical explanations. And you would have talked about that instead of yeah. the fear he experienced when his son was always dying. Yeah. Yeah, so that makes sense. Okay, so the third concept is guessing. What yeah. does that mean? So guessing ties together with asking emotional questions. Like the first way to ask an emotional question would be to say, how did you feel? Yeah. And if you say, how did you feel five times in a conversation, you're going to end up in a little bit of an awkward feeling. It's like going to the therapist's office or in the in a job interview. Right. We go from three guys in the sauna to you being his psychologist. Exactly. It's like, how did you feel? How did you feel? How did you feel? Doesn't really feel good. So what you can do is you can dif use different ways of saying, how did you feel? And one way is to guess, basically say, did you feel afraid? Did you feel worried? So I'm guessing what he felt. And the message is the same, because if he didn't feel afraid, he would say, no, I felt sad, or no, I felt whatever. So I, I ask him, how did he feel? But I'm stating something. And it has a bit of a stronger take to it than how did you feel? Because I might be right also. Yeah. I might, he might have felt worried. So then he feels like I sense him and I ask. He feels understood. Exactly. So guessing is just another way of asking, how did you feel? And another way of asking, how did you feel, is to say, I would have feel. So if he told the story about his son, and I would say, I would have feel worried. I would have feel sad. I would have feel angry. And then stop talking. That's the same thing I communicate. I say, I would have felt angry. And then he could say, yeah, I did feel angry. Or no, I didn't feel angry. Yeah. So it becomes another way of asking, how did you feel? So it's, you can ask, how did you feel? And just use those words. You could guess, did you feel this way? You could say, I would have felt this way. And you could also just tilt your head and look at someone, like stay right. silent. You could move closer in the sauna. So there are a million different ways where you could ask how someone is feeling 
without making it sound like you're in a therapy office or that you are in a work interview. Right. And that's what you did in the sauna. You just move a little bit closer, signaling that, hey, I want to know how you're feeling. Please keep talking. But you didn't need to say it and kind of create this psychology vibe. No, but I'm assuming, I don't know, but during this conversation, I probably used all of these different things. Yeah. I probably started with, how do you feel? Because it's a natural first question. And then at some point, I probably said, I would have felt. Yeah. And then I probably said, did you feel? And then I moved closer to him in the sauna. So I'm using all of these different ways of interacting because it just creates a natural flow. All right, so let's move on to the fourth concept, which is to feel your feelings. The fourth concept is to feel your feelings. What does this mean? So what this means is, as we said in the movie uh, metaphor, feeling along with the hero. You want to like be with the hero. So what happens here then, when our friend told us about this emotional struggles, I was feeling with him. Like I felt part of his struggles and I was with my emotions during this. So I wasn't thinking about a lot of other things. I wasn't distracting myself. I was aware of what's going on inside of me. And I think that's a big reason why I didn't reply to the question, how about you? Because I was in his trauma. Like I was carrying some of his pain and his sadness inside of me. So I really didn't know what to say. I didn't want to talk about my life right now because I was with his sadness. Like if you're watching a really sad movie and someone asks you to describe something happy, that's not where you want to go yeah. right then. So to just... Be aware of what's going on inside of you and, and feeling. And this takes practice and there are different techniques for being better with your, your feelings. But that's a big part of connecting with someone emotionally is to be with yourself at the same time. Right. And something that prevents us from doing this is that we're not willing to feel our own emotions. So if every time we feel sadness or pain, we distract ourselves yeah. with Netflix or candy or whatever it is, any of the behaviors that keeps our mind busy, it's going to be much harder to feel other people's feelings as well. Yeah. Yeah. The more you keep your mind busy in general in life, the more difficult it's going to be for you to feel the feelings in a conversation and really connect with someone. Yeah. And that's why that behavior leads to loneliness. Yeah. So let's uh, summarize this topic. Yes. I love this topic and I really enjoy bringing up this situation because it showed what conversation can be like when you are at level four in the empathy ladder. And at level four, you can create these profound and deep connections with people. I mean, this guy will probably remember you for years to come, but you're not aware that it's happening. It just happens from a gut feeling. You're at this unconscious competence stage and you don't need any theory there. You're not thinking of it, but you do need theory to get to level four. When you're at level two and level three, you are going to be mindful and think about the concepts that we talked about in this topic. You're going to think about, yes, I should be validating other people's feelings. I should show them that what you feel is okay and welcome here, and I would probably feel the same way if I was you. Yes, you're going to ask emotional questions instead of fact questions. Yes, you're going to find creative ways of asking how do you feel by guessing or saying that, Mm, if that was me, this is how I would feel. And you are going to feel your feelings. You're going to be willing to feel some of their pain because that's how you can relate. And this can be awkward at first. Like when you're at stage two and three, sometimes it will be awkward. Sometimes it will be uncomfortable, but that's fine. You're learning. Just keep trying, be courageous, reflect on your experiences. And at before you know it, you're going to be at level four and you're just going to have this automatic <laughs> response to people and create these connections that you have maybe never experienced before. Well summarized. Thank you. So let's move on to the next topic. How to receive more empathy. I want other people to care more about me and understand me better. What can I do about that? That is very understandable. That is the most common question I get asked on my Instagram. People want to be understood. They want other people to care about them. 
Because if they did, that would make them feel more connected, less lonely. And what you're really asking is, how can I receive more empathy from other people? Yeah. So to answer that, let's first look and remind ourselves again that the main goal of empathy is to focus on the emotional experience behind someone else's story. Yeah. So if you want to receive more empathy, you want other people to focus on the emotional experience behind your story, behind yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, I want them to focus on my emotional story. Exactly. Yeah. So this topic is going to be about how we can achieve that. And let me first ask you, do you often do things that you don't want to do? No. No. Do you often do things that you want to do? Yes. Leading questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it might sound obvious, but the first thing we need to take a look at is how can we make other people want to care about our emotional experiences? Okay, so if people don't want to care about us, they will not care about us. But if we can do things that makes people want to care about us, they will. Yes. So the first part of this topic is how can we make other people want to be empathic towards us. The second part of this topic is about once they want to, how can we tell our story in a way, how can we show our feelings in a way so that they understand and that they care about us. And then we're going to finish off with four hacks for you in the end. I like hacks. I like hacks as well. But let's start here. Let's say that you and I weren't friends yet. What could I do to make you care about me? That's an interesting question. So I think the first thing that would make me care about you is that I feel that you're nice to me. And nice is also an interesting word. Like if you're nice to me, that means that you, you care about me. I can feel that I am somewhat important. You don't just want to talk about you. You don't just want the attention. You want to give me your attention. Right. So what I hear you say then is that for you to care about me, I need to care about you first. And I need to give you something first. Yeah. I'm not sure how much it needs to happen first or at the same time. But you definitely need to care about me. Yes. Like maybe I care a little about you in the beginning. And if you don't care back, I don't feel that, then I'm not going to care about you at all after a while. Like if you, if I keep calling you and asking us, asking if you want to hang out with me, and maybe you say yes and we hang out, but you never call me, yeah. I will not feel important. I don't really feel that you care. And I'm going to start caring less about you. But if you are inviting me to things and you're doing me favors or whatever, like showing me that I matter, I will care more about you. Yes. So let's take the guy in the sauna from the last topic. Yeah. Let's say that after the experience you had, let's say the next time you're in the sauna, you are going through something in your personal life. How do you think he would act differently compared to if you didn't have the first conversation? Yeah, I think it's much more likely that he would want to get to know me, that he would stay longer in the sauna if we started talking about something, maybe even though he was in a rush or something, that he would felt he would feel that he care about me and kind of want to give something back. Yes, because you have shown first that you care about him, and we humans are programmed to return favors. Yeah. So I so often get the question on Instagram, how can I make my girlfriend understand me? How can I make my parents understand me? And my response is always, how can you understand them better? How can you improve your listening skills? How can you improve your communication so they feel understood first? And once they feel understood, then you can say what you want to say and they will want to listen. They will want to care. So the first step of getting other people to care more about us and receiving more empathy is somewhat ironically to get better at giving empathy. That if we give first, it's much more likely that people will give to us. And if we want other people to understand us, the first step is to ask ourselves, do we understand them? Are we trying to understand them? Yes. That 
if we get good at listening and we listen to others, I can see also that if I listen to you, you will be more likely to listen to me because we're not trying to interrupt each other. If I'm yes. if I'm interrupting you, you will probably feel that you didn't get to finish your sentence. Yeah, and and then you're like, yeah, we'll end up there. Yeah, so that's a good thing. Think of it as doing someone a favor. If you first give them empathy, they will want to return the empathy. Okay, so now we have made more people want to care about us. How can we make them understand us better? Yeah, this is crucial and it's the second part of this topic. They want to understand us now, but how can we show our feelings more? How can we make them see the emotional experience behind our story? And here again, I think it's helpful to think of ourselves as that movie director yeah. of a movie. Not that we should act or you know no. try to be inauthentic, but if we're a good movie director, we need to tell our story in a way so that they can understand the feelings behind the main character. Because if we can't describe what the main character is feeling, then we are going to be like this extra that James Bond shoots and no yeah. one cares about him. <laughs> yeah. right? So we need to understand the hero in the story, which is us. We must make that relatable. Okay, so we, we don't care about the extra because we don't know what he is feeling. We don't even know he's in pain when he's being shot because he's just out of the picture. Exactly. And for me, the big wake-up call was when Teal Swan was on stage and told me, you are not vulnerable enough for me to care about you. Yeah. She said, you're not showing your feelings enough for me to care about you. You're just an extra in your own movie and <laughs> your movie is not interesting to listen to. So how can I make my movie interesting? What's important to understand is that it's not so much about what happens in the story. It's about what the character in the story feels and how well you can describe that. Okay. So what Teal said is that you don't describe your feelings in the way you tell your stories. So I can't relate to you. I can't know what this story is like for you. And I think a reason I didn't describe my feelings is that it's quite... It takes some courage to do it. It's quite scary. When you tell, I'm in pain, I can be judged for it. Someone can stop listening. It can. It, it's uncomfortable to t talk to other people about our pain. But if we dare to do it, we can create meaningful interactions. Just look at the guy in the sauna. That story could have been boring. You know, his son was sick a year ago, but he survived. And one year later... He can't sleep. <laughs> it's not necessarily an interesting story, but when he told us, when we could see his legs shaking, when he told us that he hadn't been able to sleep for a year and just a light bulb would set him into panic, we could understand that, shit, this is a powerful emotional experience for him. And what happens then is that we care. Like yeah. Both you and I started to deeply care about this guy in the sauna. And it was because he showed those details And that took courage for him. Maybe we would have stopped listening or swapped the topic or something. And then maybe he would have felt left hanging or like no one cares about his feelings. It yeah. takes courage. Yeah, so in our society, we want to come off as strong and like invulnerable. Like that's We're supposed to be happy all the time and not show these things. Yeah. So to show that that's not what's really going on takes courage. Yes. And you can be judged for appearing weak like oh he's just so weak yeah when in fact he's courageous for doing this yeah he's strong for doing this he dares to let other people in and yeah then we want to take part in it yeah and people sometimes ask doesn't that make me come across as weak well you are in a sense fragile and weak in this situation yeah. this is hard for him this experience caused him to break but without admitting that We can't get help. Like he got support from us now because he admitted that I'm fragile here. Yeah. So he is weak and that's not a bad thing. No, we all are. <laughs> yes, some of yeah, us are better at hiding it. <laughs> that's true. And we can connect to his feelings because even if we haven't had a sick child, we've had fears. Yes. Yeah. And when he told his fear, we feel invited that it's safe for us to do the same. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's the second part here about caring then that 
if we listen to other people, then it will be more, they will kind of expect us to tell about us and they will then listen more to it because that's kind of the the energy. Like if we are two friends just having banter and mocking each other, then that's kind of the tone we have. Yeah. But if one person changed that scene and sharing like, this is how I'm feeling, that person is also inviting other people to share how they are feeling. Yes. So first part was how to make other people want to care about us. And that was to a large extent about caring first. Yeah. Doing them the favor of caring and they will want to return the favor of caring. And the second part is how people can understand us. And to understand us, we need to show them what we are feeling. Uh, and when they understand us, it kind of ties into the first one as well, because then they want to care more. They want to care when they understand. When they feel our feelings, they want to support and want to help. So if they don't understand our feelings, it's really hard for them to want to care. And you mentioned there were four hacks as well. What are those? Yes. The first hack is to be alone with people. It's usually a lot easier to create an empathic connection when there's just two of us. And the explanation for that is simple math. That imagine we were five people in the sauna. Yeah. It would be enough for one person there to use behaviors that block empathy to ruin that connection for the whole group. Yeah. It's so much more likely that someone story tops or interrupts or just takes the conversation away from the emotional experience. Yeah. Yeah. And if there are five people and they're talking as well, th- we can only listen to one story at a time. Yes. So we'll be five people listening to one story rather than two people listening to one story. So it's, you will only get 20% of the story time to tell your story in a sense. Yes. And it's harder to be vulnerable in front of more people because we need to trust people to some degree to dare to be vulnerable. And we might not have built up trust yeah, with true. all you the need guys to trust in the more people. That's yeah. a good point. I can also see how ego gets more involved. Like if there's five people, it's always a bit of more of a status fight, who is on top of who, who can make the funniest joke, whatever's going on. So it's more difficult to be real if there is a group of people. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I think this plays out so much in in family dynamics as well. Like around the dinner table, there might be four, five, six people, and it's difficult then to have a real conversation. Uh, but if you're alone with your mother or your father or your brother or your sister, you can have a completely different uh, dynamic. That's my experience as well. Yeah. Always at a family dinner, someone starts talking about something that is a little bit sensitive, then someone jumps in and hijacks the conversations and talks about something they've been through or ask a question that is a fact question or any of the behaviors we've been talking about. Yeah, I can see that. And I think getting understood by parents, it's... Yeah, that's one of the most common questions I've been getting on Instagram. Like, my parents don't understand me. And I think a crucial part is then, go for a walk alone with your mother. Yes. Or have a dinner alone with your father, rather than the two of them at the same time, because that will also make things more difficult. So what's the second hack? The second hack is to ask for empathy. Okay, should I just say, can you be empathetic with me? No, not really, because people might not understand that word but what we want to accomplish is to either ask for people to use the techniques to give empathy that we've been talking about or at least not use the behaviors that block empathy that we talked about in topic three so how can i do that so let's say that i want to tell my girlfriend something something that she's doing is causing me pain in the relationship So before I even start telling her, I might think that, okay, she might disagree with me here, which means that she might start to interrupt me or start judging me, or she might start to give me advice for how I can feel better in this circumstance. Then before I even start speaking, I might say, hey, I want to tell you something that is a bit uncomfortable to say. I would like for you to let me finish everything I want to say before you start talking. Is that okay? So you're basically saying, please don't interrupt me, but in a more subtle way. Yes, yes. And I know her, so I might be more aware of which behaviors could be lurking here. And then I directly ask for her not to do that. 
if she was very prone to giving advice, I might say, hey, I want to talk about something, but I really don't need any help here. I just want you to listen. Yeah. So you could say, I, I just want to share how I'm feeling, but I don't, I'm not ready for advice at the moment. Yes. Okay. So ask for empathy by asking and including in the question a subtle way of saying, please don't do this or that behavior. Yes. Uh, and pick the one that is most common that this person probably does, interrupting yes. or advising. I like that. What's the third hack? The third hack is to increase your emotional vocabulary. Increase your emotional vocabulary. What does that mean? It means getting better at precisely describing what you're feeling. So many of us use big general words to describe how we feel. We might say that I'm angry at the moment, but maybe if you took a deeper look, what you really felt is that I'm a little bit jealous and I'm a little bit frustrated and I'm a little bit sad all at the same time. But we can't pinpoint that or describe what we feel to someone else unless we have those more precise words for how we feel. Okay, and the better we get at describing how we're feeling, the easier it is for the other person to actually understand what we're feeling. Yes. And I can also see that I would care more about uh, my fiance Johanna if she said, I feel jealous about this, than if she said, I feel angry about this. Like there is yes. more vulnerability in jealous. Yes. Um, and there's a big difference in what it's like for her as well. Yeah, it is. But I think it's very common to confuse them and just yeah, say angry. Because yeah. angry is... It's probably the least vulnerable thing to say that you're feeling. It's mm -hmm. like the most socially acceptable negative feeling. Yeah. Uh, but it's also very vague. Yeah. Yeah. So you said all of these different, you felt jealous, sad, frustrated. So is it possible to feel more than one thing at once? Yes. And this is what we want to get better at describing and identifying that okay, maybe I feel jealous, but I also feel insecure at the same time. So if we want to tell someone how we feel, it's important that we pick up the whole range of different emotional experiences that might be happening at the same time. Yes, you can feel different things at the same time. And you almost always are. So you need to be able to differentiate. Okay, so you feel a lot of different things and it's good to be good at describing as many of those as possible. How can I learn how to do this? By practice, by focusing inwards and often ask yourself, how am I feeling right now? And when you do this often enough, you will develop a taste for how different emotions, what they taste like. It, after a while, it's almost like you're eating ice cream and you can feel, okay, this ice cream has three flavors. There is vanilla, chocolate, and blueberry. And yeah. you could do that with an ice cream, but you yeah. could learn how to do that with your feelings as well ah, this tastes like blueberry ice cream or jealousy. I just know what it tastes like. Um, when you say taste, you mean feel when it comes yeah. to emotions. Yeah. yeah, but it's a similar kind of impression. Okay, that makes sense. So you practice this on your own then or in conversations in general. The more you try, the better you'll get at this and trying to describe how you're really feeling. Yes, and after a while you can become really certain that you feel jealous, yeah. for example. Just the way you can be really certain that this is blueberry ice cream. Okay, so third hack, increase your emotional vocabulary. What's the fourth hack? The fourth hack is to ask the other person to listen to this episode. I like that. This episode is good. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> and it, it got a lot of theory, which is important if you guys are between stage one and three in the ladder. And if you both know the concepts and the theory, then you can pinpoint what's going wrong much easier and you can both move up the ladder together. Okay, so if someone else, if a spouse or a parent listen to this episode, it will be more likely that they will care more and give more empathy because they have a better understanding. Yeah, you can say, hey, do you remember when Eric and Emil talked about interrupting? I think that's why we ended up in a conflict in the last conversation. Okay. And if your partner isn't willing to listen to this podcast episode, which understandably a lot of partners aren't ready for, this is a really long episode, um, 
then you can sit down and you can teach them the theories individually. Don't do it in the middle of an argument, but come back later when you both have energy and you say, hey, I noticed that we often interrupt each other in our relationship. I think we would communicate better if we avoided that. Yeah, that sounds like a really scary conversation to have with someone who doesn't want to listen to this episode. Yes, it is. And and that's why starting with the easier ones, like not interrupting, and then work yourself up. So you start with the yeah, small ones and then... Over yeah. maybe a year or two years, you'd start teaching them these concepts. Yeah, I can see it's easy to just start by talking about these concepts, not necessarily trying to teach, yeah. but like, I'm excited about this concept I learned. Yes. And talk very, about very it rather than sitting down and teaching someone. Yes. Okay, so let's summarize this full episode. We started by talking about how to receive more empathy and how to get other people to want to care about us. And the crucial thing was we need to get them to want to care about us because we do the things we want to do. And one way of accomplishing that was to care first, be good at listening, become better at empathy, be the one who cares because people care about the ones that care about us. We want to invite the people that invite us. And that's simply how it works. And the second one was get better at explaining how we are feeling. If the movie doesn't include feelings, We don't care. If James Bond shoots an extra that we don't know anything about, we don't care. But if we know how the hero feels or the person in the character feels, we care. And the movie doesn't need to be that interesting. It's okay if someone's child was sick a year ago, got healthy, and you can't sleep. Like That's still an interesting story if it comes with enough emotions. And then there were four different hacks where the first one was be alone with a person. Like it's much easier to get empathy when there's just the two of us. The second one was to ask for empathy. And you don't need to ask just bluntly say, give me more empathy, but say, please let me finish, or I'm not going to need advice doing this. And the third one was... Increase your emotional vocabulary. Yeah, that's right. Get better at using different words and understand your feelings more detailed. And the fourth hack was listen to this episode or get someone else to listen to this episode. And maybe best to listen to it together because then you can pause and like focus more on different things. Did I get everything? You got everything right. I'm impressed by your memory. So let's (laughs) move on to the sixth and final topic where we talk about what happens when empathy is your superpower. Ten years ago, something crazy happened. A friend of mine called me, sounding very nervous, and told me that he had tried to steal $10,000 from me. What? Yeah. A good friend of mine called and said that he tried to steal (laughs) $10,000. Explain. (laughs) Yeah, let me tell you what happened. So I was playing professional poker back then. Yeah. And in poker, I did something that is very common, which is to stake another player. Okay. And that means that I have money and I think he is a winning player. So I give him money to play for. And if he wins, we split the winnings. But if he loses, I cover the losses. And this is very common to do if I think he's a good player, but for some reason he doesn't have the financials at the moment to play in the game. Okay. So it's kind of like an investment strategy. You believe he will do something good with the money and you will get back more. Like you would invest in a company because you have money to spare. You believe that company will turn that money into more money and you will turn a profit. Yes, exactly. And in this case, it was also a combination of that and me wanting to help a friend out. Okay. Right. So what he was supposed to do was to take the money in my account, play for them and make more money. Yeah. But instead, what he did, he set up another account in his own name, and then he intentionally lost money from my account to his own account. Okay, so he started playing versus himself. Yes, okay. yes. So that way, he could take all the money I gave him, and he would just tell me that he lost the money playing, and yeah. I would never be able to catch him on this. Yeah. But luckily for me, and unfortunately for him, the poker site discovered that something weird was going on. 
I don't know if he used the same IP on both the accounts or if he played in a way that made it obvious that this was a scam. But for some reason, they detected it and blocked his account. And now my friend was in trouble because to unblock the account, he would need my passport. And I received an email that something was weird was going on. And I, and I could see the replays of the hands that he's been playing. So it was very obvious that I would catch him. So he had no other option than to call me and just admit that this happened. So how did that conversation go? Well, I was just shocked. Like, I, I never could have imagined um, like a good friend trying to steal that much money from me. Uh, I honestly didn't even know what to say. I just said, okay, okay, okay. Then we hang up and we have kind of not spoken about that ever again. It's so crazy that he stole that much money from you. I mean, it's it's insane to think of a friend that steals any amount of money, yeah. but like ten thousand dollars. That's a like lot stealing my car. Money. <laughs> yeah. So, what did you think about him back then? That he was a really bad friend, disloyal, greedy, selfish, a liar. Just to think that he would show up at parties later, look me in the eye, and pretend like everything was fine and that we were friends <laughs> after knowing that he took that much. Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, that's... Yeah, I, I have no words. And I was angry. I was real angry. Yeah, I, I bet you were. So, but you mentioned that you guys never spoke about this again. Why didn't you do that? I think I was embarrassed, to be honest. I felt real foolish for being tricked this way and I also you know he was part of the friend group and I didn't want to I didn't know how like to tell other people in the group and I still liked him to some extent and I I just didn't want to create that kind of chaos in the group and yeah I didn't have the tools to have a good conversation with him about it so I just kind of swiped it under the rug I think embarrassed is a key word here like I got scammed once from a friend of mine, also back in the poker days. Uh, less money, but significant amounts. And yeah, I, I was just so embarrassed. Like I didn't want to tell anyone about that because I felt stupid. That there is a lot of there's a lot of shame in being taken advantage of. Yeah. So does this situation still bother you? Yeah, I'm still angry when I think of him and we're still in we still run into each other sometimes we're in the same friend group and when we do there's this awkward energy from both of us yeah would you like to stop being angry at him why would I stop being angry at him after what he did well you said that it's still bothering you would you like to be bothered no uh I guess it doesn't have much upside 10 years later. I think it's interesting. Like when I feel angry at someone, I kind of want to stay angry because I want to hurt them somehow. It feels like I'm supposed to be angry. It's some uh, vengeance. Like my vengeance is being angry. The thing is, they, especially the, for things that happened 10 years ago, they have no idea that I'm still angry. But I need to feel the anger. I'm the one who gets in a bad mood when I meet someone in a party or whatever it is. And there is this, I don't know, saying from, I think it's Buddha, something like holding on to anger is like drinking poison and hoping that the other person will die. And I think there is a lot of truth to that. Like staying angry with someone, especially like when I, they don't even know about it. It just, it hurts me a lot more than it hurts them. So I'm just assuming that if you're still angry with him, it hurts you more than it hurts him. Yeah, and I would rather be in a Buddha energy than in an anger energy when I'm at a party. So, <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, I think Buddha has, he has fun parties. I think so too. <laughs> okay, so this is an episode about empathy. 
Would you like to try using empathy as a tool to transform this anger? Yes, please. Okay, so let me give you one more quote. And it's from a German author named Eckhart Tolle. And he says that if you had all the same experiences as someone else, you would make exactly the same decisions as that person. So if you had the same experience as someone else, you would make the same decisions. And I think this is a bit too simplified. Like there are definitely some other parameters that play in like genetics and whatever. But in short, it means that if you were born in my family with my parents, my brother, my experiences as a child growing up, you would make exactly the same decisions as I would in a difficult spot. So do you think there is truth to this? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth to it and it's simplified. But this would also mean that if you were born in your friend's family with his parents, his siblings, went through his experiences, and then you got the opportunity to steal, you might have stolen. I have a hard time seeing myself steal, but yeah, I mean, there is definitely the possibility. At least the possibility increases. I mean, let's take it to the extreme. You were born, your exact genetic code, but your father was Al Capone. Mm -hmm. What is the probability that you would grow up to steal things? Higher. (laughs) (laughs) Higher. So that's the point. Like, it might be simplified going with a quote, you would do exactly the same thing, whatever. There's truth in it. But if your father is Al Capone, you're probably going to have less morals than if your father is, I don't know, Jesus. Okay, so you're saying that if I had the same experiences, the same upbringing, parents, childhood as him, I would do the same thing that he did. Yes, pretty much. And let's say this is true, then we can use uh, an empathy question to get a better understanding. And that is, what would I have need to go through to make the same decision as he did? So basically, what experiences would you need to have to make the decision to steal from a friend? Okay. I'm not sure I can pinpoint the exact experiences, but something would have needed to happen to me that made me feel insecure about money. Maybe there was really tight with money when I grew up and I feel like I need to get it in any way that I can. I probably would have needed to lie and get away with it. So I create the sensations that uh, lying make my life better. And I'm smart and I can, you know, it makes my life better because I'm lying. And now I'm starting to lie to other people and to myself. Yeah. Yeah. So let's say money was tight home. So so you wouldn't feel safe about money. You felt a lack of money. Maybe it's always a fear of money to run out. And maybe even if it's a fear to have a roof over your head because of that, it could be like a significant fear about that. And As you said, maybe you haven't learned about honesty or importance of it, which could be that maybe your parents lied to you. Maybe other people lied to you. Maybe you saw your parents lying to other people and that then impacted your relationship with with honesty. Maybe someone stole from me and now I feel like I need to steal to even things out. That's a very likely scenario. Maybe something someone stole from you. Maybe someone stole $10,000 from him. (laughs) Who knows? But that could definitely be a part of this. And so taking this into consideration, like, okay, what if these experiences happened to me? What kind of person would I be then? And you just answer that. Be someone who's afraid of losing money, being someone who's lying and doesn't really take honesty seriously. And then another question to ask is, how would this impact my life? If I was this way, how would your life look if you had this relationship with money and this relationship to the truth? I can see that I would be struggling a lot to build relationships with deep trust. I would struggle to trust other people because I would assume they would be lying to me and I would lie to other people. And if they find out, relationships could crack. I would feel disempowered in my ability to 
create something in business and in life. And yeah, I would have deep distrust towards myself. Yeah, and if you had this sense of like lack of money, how do you think that would be in your relationship with your girlfriend and when you deal with money together? Yeah, always fear and conflict. And even if I had a lot, I might feel like I don't have enough. Yeah, it might, maybe you don't want to share it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I think it's interesting to look at it this way. Like, okay, if I, what experience would I need to have to do this? And if I had those experiences, what kind of life would that create for me? And what we're doing now is basically, if we use the movie metaphor again, we're trying to understand what did the movie look like for this person? Because we're not asking the person, they can't describe their movie. We don't know what scenes they've been going through, but we try to paint the picture. We're using our imagination. And when we get angry at people, we tend to focus on right or wrong. And we spoke earlier that there is rarely a right or wrong, but we like to judge whoever is wrong. And we like to focus on just the part that they're wrong, that they're disloyal, that they're lying, that they're stealing, whatever. But with these questions, we can zoom out a little bit and try to see the pictures, see the movie, see the feelings. And it gets easier to to understand and yeah, get a more full picture of what's happening. And it's not a bulletproof system, but at least it's, well, how, how do you feel about him thinking about him now? I feel lighter in a sense. I can see before I thought more about him as this bad friend that is untrustworthy and a bit evil. And now I see him more as also someone who is human and that is struggling and that, man, I might have done the same thing if I was him. So there is more compassion in there for sure. Yeah, I think that's... You turn them into humans in a different way. I think if you're watching a movie and there's a hero and a villain, you tend to hate the villain because you only see the bad things the villain does. Yeah. But in some movies, you get to see what else happened to the character that is the villain. You get to see their evil father or whatever it is. And suddenly you start feeling for the villain. Yeah. And I think that's what happened when you do an exercise like this. You get a better understanding. Even the villain becomes human become someone you can feel with and you're focusing on something else than just the the bad thing that they did. Yeah. It takes some energy to do this exercise because it's almost like anger blocks empathy. Anger definitely blocks <clears throat> empathy. It's really hard to be empathetic, empathetic when you're angry. And I think that's it's interesting with asking the question that I did before, do you want to let go of the anger? Because a lot of the time, I don't want to let go of the anger. I want to feel this anger. I want to be yeah. furious. And at some point, I want to let it go, at least if I'm consciously aware of it. I can ask myself, does this anger serve me or does it make my life worse? And in the beginning, I can really feel that it serves me. It makes my life worse, but I want it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it feels in the yeah. beginning. It's really hard to be empathetic. But after feeling that angry for, anger for a while and maybe going out for a run or, I don't know, punching a boxing bag or whatever, to be angry for a while, then I can get to the state of empathy and I can do an exercise like this and I can do it mostly for me. I, I, I do it to let go of anger and to be happier in my day and not go around with angry thoughts spinning around. But I can also do it because if I meet them, I might want to have a good conversation with them. I, it doesn't serve me to go around being angry. I don't want to be an angry person. I want to understand this other human being, or at least I want to be a person who understands other human beings. Right. It's a part of the person I want to be. Right. And this is such a big and extreme situation, something that happens 10 years ago when someone steals money. Can I use this in more situations? Yeah, so these questions are definitely useful in these big scenarios. But you can use them in much smaller situations as well. And you could modify them a little bit to like, okay, let's say you're having a fight with your girlfriend. And you could just ask yourself, okay, what would I need to feel 
to act in the way that she did. And you could see, okay, what kind of feelings arises in me when I say that? Maybe, okay, if I felt insecure, I would have acted that way. Or if I felt guilty, I would have acted in, in that way. And you could use, you can go it bigger, like, okay, why does she think that we should treat money in this way? How could her relationship with money have been growing up? Because maybe you have different relationship is what you should buy, what couch you should buy or whatever. And ask yourself, okay, what experiences would I need to have to make decisions this way? And once again, you can paint this picture and understand more and you could deal with anger in a much more healthy way. Anger makes so much, causes so much issues in relationships and is very rarely <laughs> useful. And it very often comes down to not understanding each other and not communicating well. But this is an exercise you can do on your own. So let's say you started a fight with your girlfriend and then she went outside to go buy something or whatever. And you can use your time alone to try and understand and try to create the movie around the villain, in this case, the girlfriend. The girlfriend is often the villain in my movies. <laughs> uh, so it can be used for huge things. It's probably even more helpful for the small things. And it can be used with different versions of questions like, basically, what would need to happen to me for me to act this way? Yeah. I can see how energy consuming this type of exercises would be because it's really easy to just stay angry and think the other person is an idiot. Yeah, it is. So what happens when you stay angry is that it probably takes less energy, but for a much longer time. While doing an exercise like this, you need to like gather your energy to actually do it, but you don't need to spend your full day or full week or 10 years being angry. Yeah, I guess it reduces the risk for further conflict later on. Yeah, I think it's a huge energy saver. It's a great energy investment. You can put it that way. Got it, got it. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to try and summarize this topic? I would love to. In this topic, we have learned that when someone behaves badly towards us, it's understandable that we're angry. And it's also understandable that sometimes we want to hold on to that anger. And it feels easier to keep being angry than it is to do something about it. But we've also learned that keeping anger is a little bit like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. We're not really helping. So what we can do instead is to do an emotional investment and ask these empathy questions to try to understand the other person. And we can do that by realizing that if we had the same experiences as they had, we might have acted the same way. And then we can use that knowledge to ask empathy questions. What would I have needed to experience to act the same way that the other person did? And if I had those experiences, how would I feel today? That will build up compassion for us and it will make it make us naturally feel lighter. The anger will start going away. And that's really good because anger usually blocks empathy. Yeah, and to add to that, I think an important part is it adds understanding. Like yes. I think a lot of time we're angry because we don't understand. But if we understand, I think we're most often less angry. So that was just a little extra side point bonus. I like it. So for you listening, I believe that these are our most valuable tools that we've ever created. This episode is full of them. But tools are useless unless you learn how to properly use them. And the tools might be good, but they're not that easy to use. So you need to practice. Like go out there, take action, reflect on what worked, reflect on what didn't. Do it again. Listen to this episode again. Take in this information because, oh God, I can promise you that this has so much value and can revolutionize your relationships, your friendships, your relationship with your family and your business and everything else. I, there are no words to describe how much I believe in this content, but we can only give it to you. The rest is up to you. And we spent four months creating this episode. Four months, and we worked on it every week because we really care about this. We think that this is what the world needs. 
And now we kind of need your help because there's so much value in this episode that it's really long. And we have a little bit of fear that not so many people will listen to such a long episode. So if you found this valuable, please send it to a friend and say, hey, this episode changed my life. I want you to listen to it as well because it will improve your relationships and your overall happiness in life. Thank you for today. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Well done, Eric.